Good evening, guys, and welcome out to Revolution. This is part two of he compared 22 editions of the Texas Receptus. So this is a video by Dwayne Green. And so last time we were intending on looking at this video, but we ended up reading the article that this was based on and also looking at the Texas Receptus uh, claims on the Trinitarian Bible Society. Um, specifically this one here, I'll just throw this up. I don't want to get too bogged down in the details like I did last time. But um, there is a question in one of the articles on the Trinitarian Bible Society uh, website. And it has, are the variations between the Texas Receptus significant? And it says, no. <clears throat> These variations include spelling, accents, and breathing marks, word order, and other minor kinds of differences. As it is stated in the preface to the Trinitarian Bible Society edition of the Texas Receptus, the editions of Stevens, Beza, and the Elzebers all present but uh, um, sorry, all present substantially the same text, and the variations are not of great significance and rarely affect the sense. And so this is um, the introduction to the Texas Receptus that I've got here. So there's only two pages of English in this, and so I'll just quickly read the little bit that they're referencing. It says, the editions of Stevens, Beza, and the Elzevers all present substantially the same text, and the variations are not of great significance and rarely affect the sense. And then it goes on to talk about the present edition being based upon the text of Beza's 1598. Now, <clears throat> One thing that I pointed out, um, there are those who look at things, look at variants, look at changes. I mean, the thing is, we're dealing with someone like Mark Ward, who is basically saying there's really not much difference between the critical text and the Texas Receptus. Okay. So to me, that is ridiculous. There is so much difference. When someone says, you know, there's, oh, there's not much difference between the King James and, and the modern versions. Well, that's ridiculous too. Um, to me, I, I'm the type of guy, I split hairs, okay? I, I get the microscope out and I look at details. And I look at the differences between the New King James and, and the Old King James. And I've, I've found 500 differences between them just in the New Testament. And so to me, this is important. Um, this is dealing with the word of God. It's not just something trivial. And so I understand that the Trinitarian Bible Society usually aren't that fussy, okay, as fussy as I am. So they would say something like this, where I would say, no, the additions of Stevens uh, and Beza are, are different. There, there's even, I think, a place where there's a whole verse that is different, the whole verse that's omitted that's in Beza. Um, there's there's quite a lot. So I don't tie myself to Stevens, to Beza, to the Elzevers. The text that I have is the underlying Greek text of the King James Version. Now, that might seem strange to some people, but that's exactly what Scrivener went to um, produce when he was commissioned by Westcott and Hort to produce this Greek text. Now, the vast majority of this is Theodore Beza's work, okay? Scrivener, all he did was just looked at about 20 places where the King James differs from Beza, and he just put them in here. Now, there was about another 170 places where he changed a whole bunch of phonetics, uh, names, um, and changed Beazel Baal to Beazel Bub. They're both going to be translated the same way. Um, sometimes it might be a smooth breathing or a rough breathing. Sometimes it might have been something in a heading. But at the end of the day, um, the text of Beza is, is very, very, very close to the King James. But the King James translators did their text. Um, they did enough difference from Beza to actually warrant the King James being its own TR edition. And that's why people go, well, I go with that one. Um, some people say, well, it's been printed by Scrivener. Um, other people go, well, we look at that and think it's okay. We think it's good, very good, but it's we still go with the underlying Greek text of this. So 
where this uh, fails and a, and a few tiny little splatterings, um, we just go back to King James. And so to me, that's no big deal Okay, to do that. Um, we can also just go to the 1598 text of Theodore Beza and we can, all the readings of the King James are in this. Um, there are 20 that are in the footnotes, in the marginal, um, in the annotations. So we can look at those, okay. So if I was to give advice to the Trinitarian Bible Society, I would say, well, I wouldn't word it this way. But the Trinitarian Bible Society, they also say that the LXX is a, um, a viable document that Jesus used and the apostles used. And to me, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think that's old information. I think that's past its use by date. Um, the vast majority of TR, KJV people that I talk to um, say that if there is an, a BC LXX, show it to us, <laughs> you know, prove it to us. Uh, we don't, we believe that there could have been a few spatterings of um, Greek translations here and there. But at the end of the day, we, um, we don't see that Jesus used the Greek text to preach to Hebrew people. <laughs> it, it just doesn't make any sense. He was, he was speaking Aramaic. And so, um, so when I read through this, I can, I could probably read the next line and the next line and find fault with a lot of this in, in a sense where I'm, this is an old article. Um, this, this is 1997. A lot's happened since then. I was a Christian for what, two years at this stage. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's 2024. I, you know, some of the information on here is correct. It's valid. Some of it's n not really. But what you've got to understand is when they're talking about uh, my, things like minor kinds of differences um, and substantially the same text and things like that, you've got to understand that in this article, they're talking about, um, yes, it's talking about the Textus Receptus, but then it's also talking about the Greek text that underlies the modern, modern versions. <clears throat> and they're saying that, um, you know, they're corrupt and, you know, they've got articles to get you know, the textual key, which has like 600 differences um, that you can look at, you know, one John five sevens taken out and all this sort of stuff. So you, you've got to understand their type of language and their type of organization. But at the end of the day, you know, they basically stay, say Stevens, Beza and Elzebus. So these are three guys. And then we'd look at um, Stephanus, uh, sorry, um, Scrivener, who did his um, text in 1881, the same year that Westcott and Hort brought their text out because they wanted to show the differences. So really there's only four that we're looking at. Now, I know Stevens did four editions, Beza did five, Elzebus did two, and Scrivener did one, and so, but um, this, the main issue that I, I had was why have 22 editions of the Texas Receptus to prove these guys wrong? Now, could this be worded better? I would definitely word it different. Now, if I was a Trinitarian Bible Society guy, I would probably mention a, a little bit more, but... I would probably emphasize that the vast majority of people who are confessional bibliology people, and I guess that would include those in the TBS, um, this, um, the editions of Steve, Stevens, Beza, and Elzebus are all Protestant editions. Most of the time, they're not going back to Erasmus. They're not um, going back to the Complutense Symbolic Polyglot. Now, they might do that in studies and things like that, but they wouldn't say that those readings are warranted. Where I don't have to say that. I just I just point to what I've got in my hand and because I see this as a progression. And so um, anyway, basically, that's all I really had to show before we get into this video. So let's just jump straight in. Because last time I talked for like 
three or four hours. It was like four in the morning and I was, I re-listened to it and I was actually dribbling a lot. <laughs> so sorry about that. And I actually said Genesis 1-1 instead of Matthew 1-1. I was so tired. It was 12.30 when I started the um, video and it was like four o'clock by the time I went to bed. And I'd been up since six in the morning. I'd dr driven five hours. I was exhausted, but I really wanted to. I, it was something just irks me about this whole thing of counting other Textus Receptus editions and then holding King James TR people accountable for what happened. It, it's, it's strange. And I'm going to talk about that. So anyway, let's just jump straight into this. Hey, it's you, it's Pastor Dwayne here. Today we are going to be talking to Timothy Decker. And uh, he wrote a uh, rather interesting article lately about the Textus Receptus. And uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, so, Timothy, why don't you go ahead and say hello to everybody? Hello, everybody. Let me ask you this. So the article that you wrote, uh, you you did a, a project. I, I'm going to ask you how long it took. I, I think I did on a Facebook question or something. Um, but you, you basically compared every Texas Receptus that you could get your hands on. Uh, and you pulled out some results uh, to validate a claim. And, and the specific claim that we're talking about is those who would hold to a TR position would say, uh, or, or like the TBS article says, the TBS article states something along the lines of, you know, there's no major variance between the various Textus Receptus editions. And so you took that and you ran with it and you decided to go see if that's true. And so you compared... I don't know how many how many editions of the Texas Receptus did you compare? Uh, well, I started with Erasmus's five editions. Uh, I tried to go. Here, here's my methodology. Uh, I tried to go yeah. in, in chronology. So after Erasmus, I would use the Complutensian Polyglot, which Scrib himself mentions in the development of the Texas Receptus. Aldean, Colinaeus, those are often mentioned in in the development. Uh, two others I added in there. This was by the prompting of Elijah Hickson. Mm -hmm. um, they were. Uh, mm -hmm. They worked with Erasmus. They knew Erasmus. They were part of the uh, Continental Reformation. Gerbelius, or Gerbelius, however you want to pronounce it, and Copeful. Uh, they were both early Reformed tradition, uh, I'm sorry, early TR traditions, and they, they were familiar with Luther, Melanchthon, and, and so forth. And so I thought that would be good uh, to add in there. And then you would do your standards, your uh, four Stephanus editions. Beza is a tricky one because there's a lot of editions with Beza. And so mm. I just decided, let me do the uh, folio editions, what are Called the major editions, the, mm -hmm. the octavo editions, or the minor editions. Uh, I did not do just because, like you said, it's a very laborious project. And yes. then I did one other Beza edition that was published posthumously. Uh, and there was two different publishers in 1611, one Crispin, and I forget the other fellow's name. And I did the Crispin edition just because his name is attached to it. So I did that one as well. Uh, then, um, who am I forgetting? Uh, Beza, uh, then the Elzevirs, uh, and the only two Elzevirs that I think are. are, are uh, needing to really be developed would be the first two editions. They have others, but I think they're pretty much mm -hmm. identical after that. And then uh, the Oxford Texas Receptus is the last one I did in 1870 or 1873, just to see. And there are, I did, I, I've come across a few unique Scrivener's, Scrivenerisms uh, after doing okay. all this too. So uh, that was kind of the, the idea for these are the popular Texas Receptus editions that would often be mentioned and all of all of those I gain access either me just searching Google or Elijah mm -hmm. Hickson put me in a contact with the digital version of them I'm Ooh, so okay. amazed how he was able to he is he has compiled a, a a library of Texas Receptus editions and, and I just did 21 22 he's got over well, I don't know how many I want to say 50 60 70 he's got a lot of them we could have expanded but, right, uh, right. I have a life. I have a wife, kids, you know, job. So I can't, I can't spend That's all my right. time doing that. So what, what kind? Okay, so um, I'll just show you. This is on my website, Texas Receptors, and this is the article about the Texas Receptors. So I'll just sort of show you um, the accessibility toward um, TR editions. Okay, so in the last you know fifteen years, there's been quite a lot of work done. And so we can see Complutensi and Polyglot. You can look at archive um, and it's on there. Um, Erasmus, you can see his um, first edition. You can um, see it here. 
and so i've got them all um, lined up on this side here as well erasmus's editions colonnais force to finish editions quite a lot of beezer editions um platon's polyglot uh, one elzevers i'm not sure why i haven't got another one there but and scribner but if you um if you go through this you can see where i've sorted out uh, major editions special cases and minor editions of Beza, because there has been quite a lot of confusion about that so basically Beza did five editions his first one was in latin but he did a greek and latin commentary on it he also did a, a hebrew and latin commentary on the old testament as well so his first edition that was completely in greek um having the greek and latin there is the uh 16 uh sorry 1565 then he did the 1582 then he did the 1588 89 then his final one was in 1598 so when they talk about the uh 1611 edition that seems to be something that um it comes i think it comes from elijah hickson because um stephen boyce also brought this up in a debate that i had with him and when i examined that manuscript uh oh, he uh, gave me a link to it and it was basically the 1565 in a reprint so it wasn't a new one at all just because it was printed afterwards um like uh, stephen boyce was trying to say that they took the reading of shalt be out of revelation 16 5 um, because the editors didn't see that it, it was good and so they wanted to as soon as Beza died they rechanged it back and it's just not true and so um so it's pretty much just a nothing to go to that so these are the five editions and when you get these other editions basically it might have like the syriac new testament tagged along with it um like a special copy with Beza's own handwritten notes oh yeah that's a very interesting one actually um and so yeah you got all, all these other types of editions sometimes like the uh 1594 it's just the annotations so it doesn't have any of the the scriptures it's just all of Beza's annotations which is quite interesting and then you got the plant and polyglot the elzevers shoals uh scrivener so there's quite a lot of um, scrivener editions that are available online through uh Hathi trust and erara etc so I just thought I'd show you that. So I'll put that link into the chat. Um, so Doki is doing the rounds. I was listening to some debates, not debates, but just uh, some live programs today. And they were first thing they were saying, hey, Doki. So Doki is just prolific in, um, in being on the internet. Actually, I'll delete that one. So I showed it twice. There we go. I'll put my live banner up let people know I'm live okay so I just thought I'd show you that so um yeah 22 editions but the thing is at the end of the day we as TRKJV people we believe that around about this time 1598 between then and like the, the, the finalization of the King James that is when they nailed it because see see textual criticism at the moment they're trying to find the text now a lot of people have sort of given up that task but there are still people out there still trying to find the initial text the ausgangs text or whatever they call it and so um but the thing is we're, we're sort of like okay when are you guys going to find it see we've we believe we've already found it and we just defend that text where a lot of people like James White's like, but that's not how you do textual criticism and you know, you'd never have an apologetic in the real world and all this sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, we're not trying to reconstruct a text. We believe that the text has always been there. Now, people are like, where was the Bible before 1611? Well, it was in these editions and manuscripts. So they were still looking at manuscripts and correcting these editions as they went along it's clearly exactly what they did this seems to be mocked like um james snap jr is sort of like oh they'll just say that it was like a progression or something now i know that there is a kooky type of um you know concept where it's like you know that there's this is the 
you know, the seventh edition of the seventh edition of the seventh edition of, you know, so that the seventh edition of the King James editions uh, was based upon the seventh edition of the English editions that were based upon the seventh edition of the Texas Receptus editions that were based, you know, all this sort of seven business. I don't gel with all that. And I'm, I, I make it pretty much well known that I don't. Yeah, okay. Some people do. And some really intelligent people do. <laughs> you know, some people who, who are a lot smarter than me in, in many ways, they go with, you know, there's seven editions of this. And, and you know, there was a purification pro process. It's always a seven number thing. I don't necessarily gel with that. And But I know someone like Will Kinney, he does. Now, um, some of you might, might be interested to know I'm interviewing Will Kinney on this um, channel uh, this Friday. So that'll be very interesting. So Good Friday, I'm going to be talking with Will Kinney. And so that's going to be roughly between probably it might start about three or four o'clock in the afternoon on the Friday. And so uh, US time. And so um, we're just working out the times at the moment and we're just chatting about that. So this can be really cool. And Will believes in that. So, you know, but at the end of the day, it's like, well, I'm sure there's things that I think and I believe that Will doesn't necessarily agree with either. And he, he, um, and so, but we are open to talk about those things. But at the end of the day, we don't let it get in the way of, you know, pretty much almost everything he says I'm in agreement with because we're just looking at stats, facts, figures, and we're just saying we know where the Bible is. Here it is. And we're both saying that. And so he, um, some I, I guess like I read the supernatural prophecies into 70th week of Daniel type of concept, you know, um, especially with Palm Sunday. I, I'm always when I miss um, doing a video on Palm Sunday, I always want to do a whole thing on the 70th week of Daniel. But I'm always like I'm so busy. Um, but that type of thing to me is, you know, the Bible numerics when it comes to, you know, um, having seven kings and you know, seven uh, editions or printings and all this sort of stuff. And to me, it's sort of like it gets messy. And sometimes someone can just come along and prove that there's been eight editions and then your whole thing falls to bits. And so I just don't go there at all. I just can't really be bothered with all that. I just don't see that it helps anyone. Some people, it does. Some people are really, really convinced into believing in God by hearing about near-death experiences. And I I just never witnessed like that. You know, some people, like I've got a friend, he, as soon as he's got someone, you know, who's interested in talking about God, he'll talk about, you know, so-and-so, they had a near-death experience and they saw God and they saw these angels and this and that and da-da-da. And then they came back and, and some people are like, wow, that's amazing. Like, to me, I, I guess... Even as a non-Christian, I would have gone, yeah, but anyone can make up a, a story, you know. <laughs> and so I just try to stick with just scriptures and, yeah, things like that. But we're all made different. We've all got um, a different approach. And so, anyway, let's get back to the video. But I just, I just thought I'd show you that you can access all of these through ERARA, um, Hathi Trust, Google Books, I mean, these things, you know, 1550, 1551, um, there's a lot of material there. Okay. So let's get back to the video. Kind of prompted you to do the work because the coll collation between like two editions is enough to do, let alone, you know, what, like 30? How, how many editions did you end up with in the end? And I think it was how, 22. Uh, yeah. That, 22, that's, that's a lot. 22 different Texas Receptus tradition <laughs> editions or so forth. Um, what prompted? Well, I, I really feel like it was the only way to substantiate or uh, disavow the claims that are often made by proponents of the advocates of the Texas Receptus. And Okay, so uh, this is sort of like, okay, advocates of the Texas Receptus are making this particular claim. Um, if I was to be asked... Like, I, I haven't read this uh, article from the Trinitarian Bible Society, 
probably since the 1990s. I, no, actually, yeah, I remember going up to Papua New Guinea. It would have been about 2000, 2001 or 2002 or something like that. And I remember taking some of the TBS information with me because the pastor there had James White's book, which I constantly couldn't put down. <laughs> I'd just be in his library just reading this. And he was always like, gee, you're interested in that. And I'd say, oh, I think it's very important. And the next time I went to New Guinea, I brought him a whole bunch of the Trinitarian Bible Society material. And he read through it and said he agrees with it. And so we, we were having this conversation back in the 90s. Okay. So um, apart from that, like if someone was to come and ask me in the last, say, 15 years, are there major differences between the Texas receptors? I'd just go, oh, yeah, Comiohenium first two editions of Erasmus, it wasn't in there. So almost everyone knows that. It's not like we're trying to hide that or we're trying to be deceptive about that. We're just like, yeah, that's just what happened, you know. <laughs> and it's not like, you know, we we chew our nails nervously and go, uh, well, there, there was a change. No, we, we acknowledge that there were changes in Beezer's editions. We, we're like, yeah, Beezer like my my whole book revelation 16 5 is about how in his 1582 edition he put um ho esomenos instead of ho osios there was a difference you know so i'm writing books about these differences you know what i mean um i i've, I've never thought that it was something like to to worry about or, or i've never felt that anyone around me was being deceptive at all uh, and just downplaying. See, to me, when I watch Mark Ward's videos, he's like downplaying, you know, all oh, the critical texts and the Texas Receptus are very, very similar. You know, look at my KJV parallel Bible. If you read through that, you'll just see, look at all the similarities. There's so many similarities. And we've used the, um, you know, the anecdotes of, you know, Mark Ward, you know, he, there's this massive sinkhole in the middle of the city and apartment blocks have just fallen into the sinkhole. But he turns up, the, the media turns up and they're filming the road next to it and going, look, at, but look how good these roads are. It's like, yeah, but we're not looking at the similarities. We're looking at the differences. And so um, the, the thing is, all of this is pretty much like... Um, it's going back to this Trinitarian Bible Society article, and it's like, okay, well, I go, well, they could have worded it better. I'm not trying to defend them at all. There's plenty of stuff that Trinitarian Bible Society say that I just don't necessarily have to agree with, or, you know, I just go, okay, well, and some of this stuff's older. There's newer ways of explaining things. It's like a, an old apologetic for young earth creationism you, you might say it in a certain way and it's like nah, i wouldn't say that like that anymore but what's being made out is that texas receptors people are sort of making this claim you know so apparently timothy has contacted jeff riddle now i know jeff riddle he's sort of like well we look at um the 15th uh sorry the editions of stephanus Beza, and the king james and and Scribner, and so pretty much the same as what the Trinitarian Bible Society said. And you know, uh, Jeff Riddle is doing sermons and preaching in conferences for the Trinitarian Bible Society, so they have a very um, cohesive uh, message and uh, outlook on all this. So perhaps that's the main um, attack. But he is just saying TR people in general, where when I've sort of look at Jeff Riddle sort of saying that, I mean, I, but he's always sort of pretty pretty clear that there is differences. It's not like he's trying to hide and go, there's just no differences whatsoever. It's sort of like, you know, the differences between the King James and the Geneva Bible. Like if I was to say, okay, look, if you read the Geneva Bible, you it's like you're reading the King James in, in a sense, or the Bishop's Bible. You read through it and you're like, wow, this is very similar. But then you, there are differences. And so you would, if you were to describe that, you would say, well, substantially, they're the same. But then you could go, hang on, let's look at this difference. And that, you know, when you start getting into the minutiae, it's like there are differences. Um, and so I think there is fault on both sides here. 
So on one side, you've got the Trinitarian Bible Society saying that, you know, it's just spelling, accents, and breathing marks, word order, and minor, minor kinds of differences, okay? So where I, would, I wouldn't necessarily say that, I would say, well, um, I would probably just give details, but it's pretty hard in, a, in just an article, you know, how do you how do you describe it you know but i give them the benefit of the doubt that they do mention three editions that they're talking about here and they're saying these all present substantially the same text so i i sort of feel it's disingenuous to go to 22 especially some editions like of of erasmus's friends and say well we're going through them as well it's like okay um so anyway but then on the flip side if if timothy timothy decker hadn't actually pointed at this article with the trinitarian bible society and just said hi guys just got on Dwayne, Dwayne green show and said hi guys um i'm just doing a a look at the texas receptors i'm looking at 22 editions and we're looking at differences but he hasn't done that he's gone we're looking at these differences because of the Trinitarian Bible Society article where it says this here, uh, and so he's looking at 22 editions. Uh, the Trinitarian Bible Society mentioned Stephanus, Beza, and the Elzevers, and later on, apparently, in another article, they mentioned Scrivener. Well, I guess they do sell Scrivener, you know, so, but that's pretty much Beza's anyway. Um, and so instead of comparing just those, he's going back to the Complutense and he's going back to all of the five editions of Erasmus. He's going back to Colonnaeus. So that, that's like, what, seven other ones. Then he's going to um, the two friends of Erasmus. So that's nine editions that, that Trinitarian Bible Society haven't mentioned. And the thing is, too, the Complutense and Polyglot does differ quite a fair bit from the other editions. And so... Um, yeah, and that's acknowledged. You know, people just go, yeah, well, it's different. So the thing is, they've just been labelled Texas receptors. And so if 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 you just to me, um, let me let me put it this way. This is what I wrote on Facebook. I said, why does showing where earlier TR editions differ seem to be a gotcha moment for the new anti TR crowd? It is such a lame argument. If I said the latest iPhone is the best, that doesn't mean I endorse every iPhone. And no sane person would assume that I did. You know, if I said, hey, I've got the you know, latest iPhone here, um, I endorse that. If you get that iPhone, you, you, you know, your life will be much better. <laughs> um, am I endorsing, you know, the... the iPhone 6? No. Am I endorsing the iPhone 3? No. And it's quite funny. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll talk about a product that works to someone. They'll go and buy a cheap imitation of that product, use it, and it doesn't work for them. And they're like, it didn't work. You know? um, I'm not talking about every, anything else, but the underlying Greek text of the King James Version now, some people, for them, it's Scrivener. Some people, they go with Beza and perhaps the annotations at the bottom. But it's that's where they, they've they got the words of God. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. But then all of a sudden, we have to defend everything before that. So we've, we're holding up our iPhone saying, this is the best. It doesn't matter even if the iPhone, like I've got an iPhone 11, I think. You know, I think they're 14 now. But if the iPhone, just say I hadn't a 14, if the iPhone 13 was rubbish, it, it's, it doesn't even matter, does it, if this one is good? If this one is the best ever and it's the best phone in the world, it doesn't even matter if the iPhone 13 was rubbish or the 12 or the 10. It doesn't matter. And, and that's why I can't understand why these guys are going to these other TR editions. Um, why does Ward... And his pals keep using the same lame illogical argumentation it's like if i said if um said the boeing 737 i think it should be 747 <laughs> um bit of a typo there um 
I think that used to be the number of military bases around the world, US military bases. So I had that number in my head. If the Boeing 737, 747 is the best passenger plane. So if I said, okay, you guys, the best ever passenger plane has been the Boeing 747. You know, if, if I made that claim, but then someone popped up and said, no way. And they showed a picture of the Wright brothers. Let me just get this up because I know some people don't know who the Wright brothers are. Okay, here's the Wright brothers. So imagine I'm like Boeing 747 is the best plane. And then they showed me a picture of this and said, yeah, but these guys crashed. And I'm like, yeah, I I'm not talking about that plane. Um, yes, I acknowledge that that is uh, earlier technology, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Boeing, specifically the Boeing 747. Okay. And so... Um, you know, we can appreciate all that the Wright brothers did, good on them, brave men, innovative. And but I don't I don't really know. Do you know much about these guys? But what they did was brilliant. Okay. And yes, my um Boeing 747 might have roots, a, a genetic root to these guys because they in, invented this um, aviation concept. But at the end of the day, I'm not tied to it. And so um, why are people using Erasmus? Why are people going back to Erasmus and pointing out differences in his editions and then going to Stevens and pointing out differences in his editions and then going, going to uh, Beza? And it's like, it's, to me, it's just a straw man. And when you ask people, you know, what, what do you think of the earlier editions of the Texas Receptus? It's like, well, yeah, they, they're good. But um, now, if you were to ask me, what about the Coverdale Bible? I'd say, oh, great Bible. You know, that's amazing. You know, that uh, well, that great Bible is amazing too. And the Tyndale Bible, amazing. You know, would I say it's 100% accurate? No, no way. And so usually when you talk to people like the Trinitarian Bible Society or you talk to Jeff Riddle, you t you're talking about something that's, um, you're looking at historically for nostalgic purposes. You're going, okay, well, that's that's where it came from. Yes, they, they tried to do a very good job, Geneva Bible, you know, thumbs up most places, Bishop's Bible, yeah, you know, but a few places, no, nah, it didn't really work. But the King James nailed it. And the underlying text of the King James, we believe that's where all the words of God are found. So usually we've got that caveat. So I, I just can't understand, well, why go to the Wright brothers? <laughs> you know what I mean? And imagine not only going to the Wright brothers, I'm sure if I pulled that article up and read it through, there were probably competing people at the time you know, they probably had their technology where they, you know, started aviation and then other people, you know, did a few things and had massive accidents and died. And you know, should should I feel guilt about that because I, I've promoted the Boeing 747? No. Should I feel guilt about iPhones that they brought out with software that flattens the battery really quick so you buy the next edition? Should I feel guilty about that? No, no, I'm talking about this one. You know what I mean? I'm talking about the one that I'm talking about. So I, I just can't understand this this type of straw man. I, I just, and I don't understand why they think that we're sort of attacking them in the same way. Because it's sort of like, well, I wish these people would be more honest about our variants. And it's like, what do you mean? What, what are... <laughs> What are we being dishonest about? You know, and this is what I find. Usually things that come from Elijah Hickson come with the special show bag that you are being dishonest. And so you get the hat 
It's like liar on top of it. It's and a lot of it's passive aggressive. You get this from Mark Ward as well, but Elijah Hickson just straight out will just um, go. Well, they're being. I, I hope that they can be honest and admit this, 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 and this. And it's like, um, and a lot of it's just stating the obvious. It's like the sky's blue. I hope you can be honest with yourself. And admit that the sky is blue, and it's like, well, okay, am I supposed to feel bad about something here? You know, what am I supposed to feel bad about? You know, the right, am I supposed to defend everything the right brothers did? Every technology that they brought out, am I supposed to defend that? Am I supposed to defend every choice of Erasmus, even though I would disagree with it? You know, and half the time, I'm, I'm defending. Um, KJV readings, TR readings from these other ones. And I'm showing people pretty much doing exactly the same work that this guy's doing. On my website, just you can go through and see the type of work that I'm doing. I'll just quickly show you that. Last time I said quickly and it took ages. But that's, that's life. And so... Um, as I mentioned, we'll go to Matthew 1. Actually, we'll go to Revelation 16.5. That's where I put lots of information. Or even Revelation 1. Yeah, I might go to Revelation 1.8. So I've just been putting information there. Um, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. So we go through. I've got the King James versus the NIV. Uh, Tertullian. Um uh, Betis of Libana, so that's a manuscript, um, and the reading there matches the King James Book of Amarg. Minetti's um, uh, Latin uh, Bible, which is based on Greek manuscripts. That's a Latin Bible based upon Greek manuscripts 70 years before Erasmus. So this is the first um, Bible since Jerome, primarily based upon Greek manuscripts, first Latin Bible, 70 years before Erasmus, and the reading is the same as the King James here. Um, so I'm going through all that type of information, showing you know, manuscripts and Ethiopic and you know, Latin interlinear, Walton's polyglot, da-da-da. Um, then we're looking at yeah, Erasmus's annotations, what Will Kinney has to say about that, John Ankerberg, David Cloud, Jack Mormon, Thomas Ross, few other things so we're looking at the Complutensian polyglot uh erasmus i haven't put all the editions in but i only just started doing this like a few months ago uh just trying to find out exactly what these were saying the colonnaeus editions cessa stephanus editions um theodore Beza, his five editions and all the other uh, minor editions as well so I'm pretty much doing the same stuff. When I'm doing a study on Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, and then you know, all the other Greek, you know, Tischendorf, Westcott and Hort, Greek Orthodox Church, and Nestle text, yeah, I've got, got them there. Um, English translations, you know, going through all them, a uh, whole bunch of them. So I sort of stop when it gets to the, all the copyrighted ones. Uh, foreign language translations, Arabic, etc. Goes all the way down some Latin, you know, Complutensian Polyglot Latin, Erasmus, because these were important to look at um, specifically in the defense against uh, Jonathan Burris. So that's the type of thing that I'm doing. Okay, so, which is pretty much the same sort of stuff, but I'm not just doing it looking just for differences. I'm looking for um, things that have similarities toward the Texas Receptus and the King James, and sometimes they don't. So, you know, let's look at something that doesn't. So, so the Complutensian Polyglot here has Hotheos, where um, that's not in the text of Erasmus. Okay, and so, and as I point out up here, it's also not the reading in Minetti's um, In Minetti's uh, reading, so he doesn't have God here, as Erasmus, exactly as Erasmus has. It's exactly the same as the King James. 
And so um, that's another witness toward that. So, yeah, that's that's the type of work that I'm doing. So let's continue. And it, it, it... Actually, I'll just catch up with these comments. Doki is saying it's cool. I think for um, me announcing that I'm interviewing Will Kinney this Friday. Um, that is Tim D. I don't like a group of people out there having complete faith in a text. They should be like us who have no text to believe in. That's my motivation. Yeah, um, I, I know he tries to sort of stay neutral here and say, well, this will even benefit people and da da da. Um, I'm pretty sure Hosky has done all this. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Scrivener did most of it as well. But, um, you know, he, he's spending time in the TR. Hopefully he'll do this and then he'll start doing it with the critical text or the majority text and and just, you know, he'll find a whole heap of um, issues and contradictions and all that with these other texts and m go back to the Texas receptors. Um, so that's continued. So I'm going to find out all the useless trivial differences and make them a big deal to try and cre uh, create doubt. Well, the thing is, he's going through TR editions and saying, oh, look at this, look at that. And when I'm looking at them, there's not a huge, there's not a huge difference. Okay. Now I know there are places where there are big issues between TR editions. Okay. But at the end of the day, um, he's saying this reading here is a, it's a, it's a huge issue where Mark Ward is saying, well, you know, to have like 20 verses deleted there, it doesn't really matter that much. You know what I mean? And so on one hand, you got, um, I don't think Timothy Deckard calls himself a um, critical text guy. He calls himself like a Byzantine priority guy. But why, why are these guys on one hand, um, you know, sort of trying to downplay everything and say, oh, you know, there's really no difference between you know, between the critical text and the TR, you know, and I just say to them, well, why don't you just go with the TR then? <laughs> why have this whole fight, you know? But then you get people like, well, we're putting the TR under, under the microscope and there's a huge difference. They're very massive and it's like, <laughs> it's on one side, you've got people saying there's no difference. The other side, they're saying huge difference between our editions, you know, and it's like, it, it, it just seems disingenuous it seems completely unbalanced like would he see the thing is if i said okay will you debate mark ward about the importance of these um these issues now i know later on he's sort of like look i'm i'm only doing this just to show that there are variants uh, but then he's like you know and people need to be honest about it and so so at the end of the day, maybe write to the Trinitarian Bible Society and say, hey, you know, this, this and that. But I don't know any TR person who's saying that the earlier editions of the Texas Receptus are, you know, all cohesive or whatever. It, it just seems like a straw man argument that Mark Ward's made up and people are actually believing it. I, I saw this with James White. He would make up something. Like the you know the old Dean guys copied Erasmus's first edition and and then Erasmus tricked himself and thinking that the reading was from the old Dean guys when it was really his own edition ha <laughs> ha you know it's this type of strange thing but then you hear people repeating it and it's like you're not really believing that are you and when when I watch Mark Ward I'm like he's like the Texti Recepti all these you know twenty eight different Textus Receptus editions they differ from each other and it's like yeah, we, we all know that. <laughs> it's like it's a big gotcha thing. They differ. So, um, okay. <laughs> it's, it's like saying to us scientists that the elements are different. It's like, yeah, <laughs> but, you know, we know that, we, we understand that. It was not that I set out for a mission. I, I'm finding myself, as I'm collating these things, and, and this is what's called um, a diplomatic. What what I was doing is a diplomatic uh, edition. Uh, I'm not I'm not doing a critical text. I'm doing a diplomatic text. So Scrivener's 
1881 was my comparative uh, text, and I compared everything from that. And so I'm not trying to assess which is the best TR reading. I'm just comparing everything to Scrivener. And right. I, the only way I could think of to say, is, are these claims true or not, is to just go through them. And uh, I found myself actually uh, surprised, so surprised at how often I would come to a uh, a, a variant. You call it a variant. Uh, yeah. That I, I was just expecting their claim. I, I did not expect the outcome. Expecting their claim. Um, so A. Hannes says... I'm sure Hickson gave him the motivation and resources because uh, E.H. has a pas passionate, um, Elijah Hickson has a passionate dislike for TRKJV text people uh, that he tries to keep suppressed, but it speaks loudly. And Elijah Hickson did not have time to do it. But that's just a conjecture. Yeah, um, I think we all know that Elijah Hickson, I mean, I've probably on Facebook, I've converse with Elijah Hickson probably more than anyone. And um, I think there was one thread there where we had 500 posts, 500 um, comments on this one post. And, um, yeah, it just was going back and forward. Back, but he kept calling me a liar. <laughs> that's that's how I got to know what Elijah Hickson thought of you know, people like myself. And, and he was just like, you King James only. Uh, great point on the contrast between the just weights and measures. Small variation, uh, small variations, TD and 30 verses, Mark Ward. Oh, yeah. So Timothy Decker, small variations and 30 verses, Mark Ward. Yeah, it's, I mean, they're both linked to sort of Elijah Hickson. He's part of the Textual Confidence Collective. It just seems um, that this is a huge imbalance. And so, but, but the thing is, I would say, look, we're, we're our own individual people. We have our own thoughts and everything. I would just say, well, you've got to sort of treat TR, KGV people as their own individual people with their own thoughts. I don't, I don't have to tie myself to everything the Trinitarian Bible Society has ever said or done. Um, if they're saying there's hardly any differences between Beza and Stephanus, I would probably say, no, nah, I think there are differences um, that need to be talked about. But um, how would I explain, you know, if someone said, are there huge differences, like if I was talking about modern Bibles, are there huge differences between the NIV and the King James? I'd say, yeah, huge. Now, if you said, what about between Geneva and um, the King James? I'd say, oh, no, this substantially it's the same text. I would probably say the same thing and you probably would too it just depends on the context if i'm pretty sure if you just read through the whole article you'll probably get a different sort of flavor but i'm not defending them either it's just like you know if if they've worded it awkwardly bad that's bad on them um but i don't have to defend the trinitarian bible society i'm not defending the Wright brothers i'm not defending the b um 52 bomber i'm um, saying the boeing 747 is the one that's it um and you know focus on that <laughs> you know what i mean uh the difference is that they don't accept the verbal preservation concept like we do they don't have that standard and feel free to pick and choose between variants in the text apparatus in the na yeah they sort of I think, too, there's been this push, and it's sort of strange. It does seem to come from majority text people who want to make um, TR editions. So it's a bit like the Jay Green one um, that I got on my shelf, which has the, the all the majority text notes in it. It's like they can't just make a TR. They've got to put their own little thing on it. And there was a there was quite a big push for people to have a TR edition with all the variants at the bottom. So this might be the puppy feed of that. You know, I guess Elijah Hickson and other people are pushing for it. Someone's pushing for it somewhere up the chain. And um, people are mentioning it on videos and things. But it, it became a big thing. Why don't they have the TR with all the editions? It's because we've already nailed it. <laughs> Why do we have to see things like, say, in Matthew chapter 1, 
verse 11 it has jacob okay in the geneva bible and in the bishop's bible now in the king james it doesn't have that name none of the modern versions have it it's it's just the wrong name to have okay but we look at that and we go well it's just that's a wrong reading now that was in the marginal notes of stephanus now should we focus on that or should we just move on from there should we just go okay geneva had it bishops had it most people don't even know about it and so what would should we even have a footnote about that it's it's not even relevant to this generation just just leave it just have the reading of the genealogy you don't have to have every bit of minutia every little thing along the way like do we do we jump on a boeing 747 and they're like well you know it's teach you the history the wright brothers you know they they crashed but um then you know these other guys got involved and they you know were able to keep the plane in the air for a little while but they're only able to get 100 feet off the ground and yet you know, do you have to learn all that to fly in the plane no what, what why do we have to know all that information yes historians yes people who are into bible nostalgia and bible nerds and geeks and all those other dudes yeah get into it but for the average person that they, they don't need to know this stuff you know so helg says uh they believe the verbal preserved text is found either in the text or the apparatus of the na28 though that edition does not have all the evidence yeah it's interesting because uh, at times it doesn't show all the readings and it's only a new thing i mean when you looked at the first edition of the nestle text it was basically um westcott and hort the Tischendorf and the Weymouth. And I'm pretty sure the Weymouth got replaced by the Weiss text. So it was three texts. And so what they did was they went with the majority. So if there was uh, two against one, they would go with the two and they put the other one in the margin as a, as a footnote. So that's all they had. Um, so, at, and then they started putting in uh, marginal notes down the bottom where Codex D differed. Um, after a while, they were putting those in. But now they've just got a yeah, smorgasbord of all this stuff. But they're, what they're doing is they're pretending that they got, they're looking at all this information where actually what they're doing is they're going to Vaticanus and Sinaiticus still, which are the last 12 verses of Mark prove that. With two manuscripts that don't have those 12 verses, they throw everything else out. They delete the apparatus and go, we're just going with with um these two of our favorite manuscripts so they've basically got all the that information at the bottom and it's just it's just nothing that they're, they're most of the time they're going with vaticanus and Sinaiticus, and um so to me it's disingenuous that when they use this argument dan wallace uses the embarrassment of riches says yes we have this embarrassment of riches of all these manuscripts and everything so someone goes, wow, you've convinced me, Dan. I'm going to jump into your crew. I'm going to go to your church, okay? They go to the church, and they're like, where's the embarrassment of riches? Can you show us? It's like, oh, well, actually, now that I've got you in the church, I'll tell you the truth. It's only really Vatican and Sinaiticus. All the rest of it we just throw under the bus, you know. It's just to get people in. You know, this embarrassment of riches. Yeah, yeah, well, these are all. But that's embarrassing, isn't it? It's, it's We've got this um vaticanus and sinaiticus and we join them together they they differ like immensely but we joined them together and created this text it's like what about the majority tech? what about like 99 percent of all other manuscripts <laughs> if you thought dan wallace actually said if you follow the majority text you're a modern day marcionite <laughs> well what about all the embarrassment of riches and all that it's, uh, under the bus and so the, there's a hole in their apologetic as well and a hannah brings up a very good thing it's textual deism it's like god in the beginning just said hey uh here's the bible uh it's inspired and just sort of threw it out the door and just went see you guys and shut the door and he has nothing to do with the text it's just it's just people just scrambling around scraps and they find a bit in a bin and they find something in a cave and they find you know they're trying to piece it together with, with sticky tape and it's 
it's just a mess where when you read the bible the bible clearly says that it will be preserved and that you know, heaven and earth will pass away my words will not pass away it's very clear that we are going to have the words of god with us you know, so anyway let's continue on with the video that i that i got i, I was expecting there to be a lot more stability uh, a lot more uh unity and there is there's a lot of unity I, don't don't get me wrong uh the tradition itself is a very stable tradition but i think it right. it, it does force itself into the idea that the texas receptus is its own stream of textual family uh or text type even you could it's not byzantine it's its own text type if you right. want to do that way but yep yep uh, it's not byzantine <laughs> it's its own text type well at the end of the day it's not just you know a byzantine text okay the the it's the byzantine text is the foundation of the textus receptus then things are looked at in the light of everything else okay and so we would all admit that the septuagint of the greek orthodox church is corrupted now even the um the orthodox study bible i think it's like a it's got like a new king james type of septuagint in it um they they have to go to the masoretic text a lot there because there's so many silly readings but thankfully they have the masoretic text that they can check with so this is the thing with the greek orthodox church's text erasmus is pretty clear that there could be errors in that and sometimes he's spotting parablepsis sometimes he's spotting places where there's errors there's grammatical there's solecisms there's things that just not making sense and just like in the septuagint you can see that everywhere and so um he's looking at the latin tradition as a translation of the greek he's looking at older things um looking at lorenzo valla looking at um many people who came before him early church writings to validate readings not just go well we've just found this document and that's it no no you you don't do that you 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 wouldn't do that with any book like if you wanted to create the most pristine book that you you had you would get as many editions as you could you would examine things and you would if if it was had been translated to other languages you would look at them and go why are they translated that way Perhaps the earlier reading was this, and then that, that triggers a thought, and then you go through and you're like, yeah, that's exactly what Origen said here. That's exactly what Tertullian said here. That's exactly what um, this, you know, these other manuscripts, it might be a minority Byzantine reading, but it's definitely, it makes grammatical sense, it makes theological sense, and it, it corrects this contradiction, corrects this error. Uh, and so that that's the type of thing that they were, they were working with. Um, yeah, so I, I felt like that was the only way I could, in my mind, either disprove or prove the claim of, uh, of you know, the Trinitarian Bible Society claims about, you know, hardly any uh, differences, very minor insignificant differences. Well, let me put it to the test and see. Um, mm -hmm. I knew that there was one passage. So I did the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 6, 7 and 8. And that com comes out to be 111 verses. And so I knew that there was one important variant by Beza at Matthew 6, 1. And I wasn't sure which variation, which edition it was going to show up. I just knew uh, mm. in Beza's 1598 edition, the one that the King James would use. Yeah. I knew that he, he took an alternate reading there. So I said, all right, this seems to be a good place, the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, I was just going to do Matthew 6. And then when I'm talking with a couple other guys to see if this is a project worth doing, research worth doing, they said, just go ahead and do the whole Sermon on the Mount. So I said, well, that, that stinks because now that's a whole lot more I have yeah. to do. Um, <laughs> that's but right. I'm glad I did. It was, it was worth, worth the time. Yeah, nobody, I don't think anyone has ever done anything like that. So you're, you're kind of like trailblazing, right? <laughs> okay, so on Matthew 6.1, he says this is like very substantial. Now, I, I don't know if it came up on the Texas Receptors Academy. I might have even been the one who started talking about this variant. Um, now, I'm just looking for it. Um, 
Anyway, um, because I actually put, um, I'll just shut that Facebook down. It takes up quite a lot of my bandwidth and can make the video lousy. Uh, Matthew 6 1, Textus Receptus. Let's have a look. So the preface of Scrivener talks about this issue. Um, so Dikai uh, Sunan, so you can see it's got the final new there, but let's have a look. So we can see um, Beza. I've got his R fifteen ninety eight annotationus. So this is the difference. Now, what's quite interesting is that Scribner, in his eighteen eighty one text, he changes the text uh, from Dikai Sunen to L A. Mosunin. And so I'm not sure his exact motivation to do that, but he didn't mention it in his 190 list. Okay. So I was reading back through the preface of Scrivener and I saw that he had done this change. So I might even get um, 1881. Actually, if I go to my 190 list, 190 visa. Um, it'll come up. So Derek McClure says, Evening Nick, hope things are going well down under. Yes, they're going swell. So um, let's have a look at, I think this is like a Hathi Trust. Oh no, it's a parallel Scrivener edition. So let's hope that doesn't just suck on my bandwidth and we end up with some blurry screens. So that's just loading up there. But it's interesting that this is this is a change between Beezer's 1590A and Scrivener's, but it's not mentioned in the appendix at the back of Scrivener. So, um, you know, a lot of people recently have been asking me about Scrivener and, you know, the Textual Confidence Collective, you know, these guys are sort of talking about Scrivener. So this is something that um, upsets a lot of people. When I say, well, Scrivener was no friend of the Textus Receptus, Scrivener was a friend of Westcott and Hort, Scrivener was a friend of the critical text. Yes, he didn't want to chop off all your, um, all your fingers and thumbs. He might have wanted to keep your thumbs, but he still wanted to cut off all your fingers. Um, there are books now last my last video I actually recommended a book called the plain introduction to uh, textual criticism I think by Scrivener now I I went through that and I couldn't find the 43 or so uh, English verses that he wanted to delete so um, it might be in a different book of his but I would just go through his books and um, yeah so it wasn't in the plain introduction to the criticism in the New Testament but maybe it's in volume two or something like that. I'm not really sure, but I've looked at that quite frequently. It is a real book. Okay, so let's look at this. We'll let that load up. And I'm, I'm going to read some of Gavin McGrath's material. Now, Gavin McGrath has given me permission to use his material. He's a fellow Australian, lives in the same state as I do. Um, and he's given me permission to, to use it. So I'm, I'm actually not sure. I might just bail out of this one here because it doesn't look like the, the usual Hathi Trust one that I use, which has the preface. 
um, it, it looked like a different one, like a parallel um, you know, Greek Westcott and Horton one side sort of thing. Okay, yeah, so this is the appendix at the end, and it doesn't, like if we go to Matthew here, it doesn't have, you know, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. There's a change. And clearly it says containing a list of passages in the Greek text of this volume wherein the readings of Beza's New Testament, 1598, are departed from. But Scrivener did depart from it. And so it's kind of dishonest. And what I found was the reading that Scrivener has is exactly what Westcott and Hort has. So it's sort of like he snuck in a bit of a reading there. Um, okay, so here we are. Um, so, yeah, I, I was thinking the other day, yeah, that's right, there were some words that were changed by Scrivener that he didn't seem to... Um, think were that important and so he changed them but there was one that he mentioned hopefully i can find it that is exactly this uh, matthew chapter 6 verse 1 issue so So maybe I'll grab that. I'll look for that in the background while the video is playing. And um, hopefully we can find that. But let's let's just continue with a bit more video. And I'll go back to um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, um, as it gets mentioned again. Possibly. It's giving comparison. me the idea of, of continuing on. And the project would be daunting, but to do the entire New Testament... Hmm. Uh, I think that would be a, a neat exercise. And I could see it profiting uh, multiple groups, whether you're for the TR, against the TR. I could see everyone benefiting from having yeah, a like I, I think even apparatus our, of all these additions. Yeah, even our uh, brothers in the in the confessional bibliology camp would probably find something like that interesting. I, I'm sure that they would see that as a, a threat. At least some of them might. But, but it, initially, it would be good to see uh, where the TR has has the variance. When it comes to dividing the variance that you're seeing up into categories, you, you came up with three categories. There was category one, category two, category three, and you kind of had a different level of effect it would have on the meaning uh, of, the, of a specific passage. So can you kind of give us uh, a sort of rundown of what each category was and how you broke down how, um, how different the variants were? Yeah. So there, the categories were based on the words of the, the two articles I cited from the Trinitarian Bible Society. Hmm. And they, they spoke in terms of there's no significant differences. There's only minor significance of spelling, you know, variation and other untranslatable differences and things like that. I'd, I'd have to read it. OK, so let's do that. So as I mentioned, I sort of felt it was a little bit disingenuous because it pretty much mentions Stevens, Beza, and Elzevers in that context. And it's basically from here to there is basically saying, go to the Trinitarian Bible Society edition of a TR, read this section, um, and you'll get the gist. And so when you read through it, it's already mentioned like about 30 different TRs, and but then it says this. So that would mean that really they're only saying that these three are quite cohesive. The other ones, when you're looking at the commuhanium taken out and things like that, they're not that cohesive. You know? So um, could it be worded better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I wouldn't go as far as to you know, say, I would give them the benefit of the doubt that you know and not think that they're just being absolutely dishonest here so this is where i guess like someone like elijah hickson's gone through he's reading this and going hey they've said um these uh you know when, when asked about texas receptors these variations include spelling accents breathing marks so you know if someone was to say to me 
the differences between King James and NIV, I say, yeah, huge differences. Differences between the King James and Geneva Bible, so, well, I could even have this. You know, it includes spelling and accents and, you know, yeah, maybe comma here and there and word order and other minor kinds of differences. Um, you would probably answer it the same, wouldn't you? If you were comparing a huge thing like the critical text to the text of Receptus, you would probably just a narrow... Um, you know, cursory sort of way of saying it. Um, but this has sparked a whole thing saying they need every TR, they're, they're defending every TR and saying they're all pretty much the same. Could you get that out of out of this? Well, you know, if, you, if you're completely ignorant, probably, but um, the vast majority of people know that the Comuhanian isn't in... Erasmus's first two editions, and that's that's a huge deal. So, if you brought out a King James Bible tomorrow and it didn't have the Comuhenium in it, I wouldn't be buying it. Most TR KJV people would not be buying that because we think that that's wrong. And so, when we we would say that there's quite a bit big bit of difference between even if it was just that verse taken out. So, anyway. Um, I think you've heard me harp on that for ages, but he just brought up that article, so I just sort of bring it up again. Sure. So I thought, well, there's two categories of one that it might affect a sense, but only if you're, you know, looking at the the grammatical categories in Greek, um, what might distinguish, you know, an, an, an aorist versus um, a present tense. Right. Um, with a non-indicative that that's somewhat major i'm teaching my greek students that's important but you know how it comes out in translation might not even be noticed right then you have those where uh you you have spelling differences or things like that uh or just leaving off the final new or the final sigma those things those are only important for people who are doing that kind of research on that kind of you know pedantic level uh yeah and, and it's important because sometimes you see progression sometimes you see regression and so i i included that but i didn't include uh those in my count and so there's two categories right there, but I thought there needs to be another category just in case they were wrong, and there was. What if there are right. significant, translatable, like you could read them in your King James or your New King James or whatever Bible, and you could see that there is a difference. Well, they didn't account for that. So that's where a Category 1 variance came out. And it could be, some might call call um, changing a an upsilon to an, an eta, making it u to we is all it would yeah. take to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, an insignificant variant, or at least a category two. I bumped into category one because uh, when it comes up to the Lord's Prayer, you know, we're so accustomed to hearing our Father who is in heaven. But there sure. were a few Texas Receptus editions that said your Father mm -hmm. who are in heaven. Which So this is, um, like, don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I don't mind Timothy Deco. He seems like a very smart guy, a very nice guy. Sometimes when we're dealing with these uh, these guys who talk about the Texas Receptus, we can be pretty harsh on them because, you know, they're, they're coming against our text and, and all the rest of it. And, you know, he might might even cloak this as like, we're, we're not coming against the text. We're coming against this false claim and all this. But we've, we've been here before. <laughs> it's not our first rodeo. We've seen a lot of people come, a lot of people go, uh, who make a whole bunch of claims and sort of get everyone's back up for you know a couple of months dealing with all this mess, mop it all up, and then by the time we mop it all up, someone else comes along and talks about the preface. We never read the preface apparently, and and then they talk about you know <laughs> um, contradictions in the King James, and you know so that's why I offer to debate people because oftentimes if if, if it's a formal debate, they have to really back up their claims. And so um, I just want to show you this issue. He's basically saying there were Texas Receptus editions that were saying your father, which art in heaven. Okay. Now, is that true? I'm going to just take you to Theodore Beza's text. Okay. So this is his 1598 on Erara. So this is Matthew. Now, we'll jump to um, a little bit further down the line. We're trying to get to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, I think it is. Um, okay, so we, we are 
ages away from it. <clears throat> okay, that's chapter eight. Let's go here. I did have this up actually, and I, I shut it down. I thought I won't use this, but straight away I need to use it. Um, six, nine. Perfect. Right on it. So you can see here in verse eight, okay, it has um, uh, Hermon here. Now, if you, most people know the Lord's Prayer, you know, say it will say, um, yeah, don't do your do your good deeds before men, you know, etc. So it's it's talking about the word your here. So then it has the exact same word here, doesn't it? So would that say pater um hemon ho entois uranos father as say your father which is in heaven? So what do you do there? It's, it's got the your there. He's saying he's to checking TR editions. Yep, it's the same word as there, and it's your. If we look down here, that's what it's supposed to be. Hemon. And so basically you've got an upsilon, and you've got the difference between this and this is just a print error so it's just a print error that's all it is how do i know that you just go to the latin because this latin is a translation of the greek okay so it has pater noster now what does pater noster mean in latin our father if you ask any catholic say the pater noster what does that mean our father so in the latin it's our father that's pretty clear it's just that it's, it's a typo here so he's saying it says your father which is in heaven. And he's bumped that up to category one saying this is a hugely important thing. So it's it's just a typo. I mean, when you when you look at the Greek language here, can you imagine putting all this together backwards using a mirror? Um, using you know capital Greek letters, pater, you know, and that's probably why people were focusing on the capitals and not really focus on the next word, created a, an error. And this error might have gone unchecked for a few editions. And then it's like, oh, hang on. And so when you check earlier editions, which I've done, it's it's exactly the same word as this. It's exactly the same letter. So um, the eta and the upsilon this is a very common issue in manuscripts and also in printing. Okay. So, but what should it really read? Well, thank Beza for having his Latin here. It says our father. That's what it should read. So it's just, it's just an error. It's just a print error. Um, print errors occurred. And um, should we be all upset about that? No, it's just, it's just nothing. So let's let's see what he's saying about this. Let's just rewind it a little bit. Sure. A few, the category we is all it yeah. would take to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, an insignificant variance, or at least a category two. I bumped it to category one because uh, when it comes up to the Lord's Prayer, you know, we're so accustomed to hearing our Father who is in heaven. But there were sure. a few Texas Receptus editions that said your Father mm -hmm. who are in heaven, which, I mean, that would just disrupt everything. And so that's a translatable, noticeable difference on a very well-known quotable passage. So I thought these need to be in category one. because I think in the Sermon on the Mount, there was 10 or 11 of those uh, pronoun uh, issues. So if it's translatable and uh, significant enough that it should be, I, I included it in category one. So the categories themselves came from the, the articles or the, the preface from the, the TR. I'm using their language and affirming to the categories, you know, minor variants mm -hmm. or spelling insignificances. Mm -hmm. But then the other category I added were if they were right or not, if they're wrong, then there's a third category or 
category one is what I called it. Most significant variant uh, or most surprising one was the one I had mentioned earlier from Matthew 6, 1, where Beza, uh, his 1598, uses the uh, righteousness that if you uh, do your righteousness, uh, your righteous deeds before mm -hmm. men versus your charitable deeds, which that, I mean, yeah, that that's. So we'll we'll listen to what he has to say, and then I'll go into my um, Texas Receptus article on this. It's insignificant in terms of interpretation, maybe. The words are completely different, and the reason it does matter is because... And so, um, yeah, I'll let him finish. <laughs> I've just got to stop talking, giving you the answer before they've um, stated the problem. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is build off, built off of threes. Um, if you if you do some intricate studies on the the tapestry the organization, uh, it's built off of three. So Lord's Prayer, you got three. You know, uh, your will be done, or you know, your name be magnified, your will be done, uh, or your uh, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's it's done in threes. The mm -hmm. whole thing is done in threes. And so if you take the charitable deeds uh, reading, which the TR by and large does, then it absorbs verse one of Matthew six into uh, the, the preceding context, whereas if you take one as the righteous deeds, it kind of becomes a, uh, interpretively, it becomes this, this introduction to the group of three that you'll have with charitable deeds, fasting, and praying. And so, it, I mean, that, that turns out to be a significant variant, not just because the words are completely different, but also because it leads to a different interpretation, and it, it could have effect on how you understand uh, Matthew 6 in the preceding context, and uh, the, the the structure of the Sermon on the Mount. And not okay. only that, uh, a lot of people have cited Matthew 6, 1 in, in the Reformed tradition. I, I came across this uh, just as an interesting variant by looking at how Reformed, Orthodox, and, and, and Puritans had dealt with this variant. And they kind of like, it could be this one or it could be that one. And, you know, you decide. So they kind of leave right. it up to the reader. And so um, that's why I thought that might be a good place. And uh, that was still a stunning variant that, and perhaps what, what makes it so stunning is that in all of Beza's edition, except for the 1598, his last edition, mm -hmm. he leaves it as the uh, merciful uh, or the, the charitable deeds rather than the righteous act. Right. Um, he, he leaves it there, but in every annotation, he argues for the righteousness reading. Well, finally, he okay. gets to the end. And he says, I'm just going to put in righteousness. So it makes me realize there is a lot more to be done. And I think Jan Kranz has, has brought this out. If you want to know what Erasmus or Beza were thinking in terms of text criticism, it's not necessarily their Texas Receptus that you need to look at. It's their annotations. And right. so a project like that needs to be done. Someone needs to go through Beza and um, translate his annotations so we can have a better understanding. Or we all just need to learn Latin really fast. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> I, I have so much on my plate now. I'm not proficient enough to, to do that. Right. But we, we already knew where he stood on that reading, but what prompted him <clears throat> to finally make the change in the text? And I think what makes that very significant, if I can use the term variant, mm -hmm. is that it kind of shows their hesitation to deviate from the tradition. Jan Kranz kind of makes that point that once Erasmus kind of laid down that foundation, there was... They were very slow to uh, change or move away. And um, especially by the time you get to Stephanus, he kind of sets the platform. And then yeah, yeah. there's a lot of hesitation to change from that. And I think that's just one sign. Which is pretty much what the Trinitarian Bible Society says. <laughs> the text of Stephen's, Bees, and the Elizabeths pretty much have substantially the same text. So that's pretty much what the Trinitarian Bible Society guys said which he's saying young Kranz is saying and he's repeating it so i think he's in agreement with that so that is so that's why you have to go to 22 editions to look at all these differences anyway we're, we're going to look at the matthew 6 1 issue and luckily just in, i think it was like two months ago i just i just started working on that um on my website because i'm actually going through <clears throat> um matthew and just tidying up my website because sometimes you go to one verse and there's just not much there. So I'm going, I've gone through Matthew. I think it's all of Matthew uh, up to chapter six, verse one, or maybe I've gone a little bit further than that. But yeah, that was where I found this, this issue. 
it, it, and the thing was i organically found this issue it wasn't like i watched something and i'm pretty sure i put on the tr academy as well and so it, it, it would be interesting to see um I, i'm going to look through the tr academy and see you know because i know timothy decker does go on there and he does frequent that um that page and sometimes it's not until these videos are made you, you don't realize who's actually in the group and so um perhaps this sparked this whole adventure and, and take that for what it will what, what you will maybe, maybe that's a good thing maybe it's a bad thing maybe they got overly conservative uh, uh aired on the side of caution i don't know uh, or maybe it speaks to their understanding of providence and, and preservation whichever i'm just saying i think that shows you that at some point though beza said i cannot in good conscience uh leave the charitable <laughs> deeds reading in matthew 6 1 and so he, uh, for whatever reason he switches it in his final edition and uh so that that seems to be pretty significant that's interesting are, are there any other uh, variants that you've okay so that's his matthew 6 1 argument i'll just quickly look at what helg says so helg says it's actually good that timothy is doing this work so that it becomes more widely known why why advocate advocate hiding anything anyway who is and this only gives TR defenders an opportunity to narrow down the exact TR text we defend. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like he's doing all this study and everything. Pretty much it's what we do to prove our readings. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so there's a reason why Beza did what he did. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's very interesting now. I'm going to, I'm just going to change gear a little bit and I'm going to go to my website. So bear with me here. We are, uh, got so many pages open. I might shut the Wright Brothers article down. I don't need that open anymore. Here we go, Matthew 6 1. So I found the issue so i've got the annotations of visa here so i found the issue it's actually not in um it's not in the preface to the um texas receptors that i thought it's actually in a plain introduction by scrivener okay so this here says um like synonyms so he he believes these are synonyms Scrivener, okay. Synonyms are words often interchanged and so form various readings, the sense undergoing some slight and refined modifications or else being quite unaltered. Um, now, I wish, maybe I can get a bit bigger. It's quite blurry, but I should be able to. Thus, um, Ife should be referred to as, and that's just too blurry for me to read. But here he has um, the issue, okay, where he's talking about Matthew 6 1. Uh, we should adopt this reading rather than this other reading in Matthew 6 1. Okay, so he's talking about this is a synonymous issue. So what's actually happened is this has become just uh i guess it's like someone just saying just you know a, a certain word should just be this word and people have just gone with it um and it just seems like something that, that uh scrivener has changed and so you can see here in the uh, nestle text you have dukaya sunan um but you see you have the text of Beza reading in the Greek Orthodox Church, text of 1904. Westcott and Hort had Dikaiosunan. Okay, so let's just have a look back up here. This is the change. Okay, so... so Dikaya Sunan, sorry, is the Beza reading. And 
Eli Mosunen is the Scrivener reading. Um, so no other explanation can be given for this change other than Scrivener felt they were synonyms. Okay. Ah, I actually typed this out so we can read it. <laughs> That's great. That's good. Here we go. Syn synonymous words are often interchanged. So this is Scribner in his plain introduction. Synonymous words are often interchanged and so form various readings. The sense undergoing some slight and refined modification or else being quite unaltered. This um, F.A. should be preferred to um, Epen, Matthew 22:33, where Epen of the common text is supported only by two known manuscripts, that at Leicester and one used by Erasmus. So also Omaton is put for off of Thalmon, Matthew 9.29 by Codex Beza. So I'll sort of skip some of this because it's just going over a whole bunch of stuff. But then it says, um, there's usually some internal reason why one should be chosen rather than the other. If the external evidence on one side does not generally preponderate, when one of two terms is employed in a sense particular to the New Testament dialect, the easiest synonym may be suspected of having originated in a gloss or marginal interpretation. Hence, the Latin heteris paribus, we should adopt dikaiosunen rather than epimosunen in Matthew 6.1. So that's exactly what he's saying that they should adopt. Um, we should adopt this instead of that. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's have a quick look at what Beza has. Sorry about the joltiness of what I was just saying there. Um, I haven't gone over this, so I'm just sort of winging this. Okay, so you can see, actually, that's the reading of Beza. So that's why I'm getting confused, because in my heading... I've actually put that it's that bees is saying the opposite one, which isn't good. Okay, so let's edit this. So Beza has that. Cut that. There we go. <laughs> it's good when you don't have the opposite words. That will help us with our argumentation. So let's go down to Beza. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> no, B I was right. And I've changed it. Anyway, I'll edit this later because Beza's text does have the Dikaiosunan De reading. So, where well, I've just got it wrong there. It's a little bit confusing. So, um, anyway, this article will help everyone, it'll help me too. Matthew 6, 1a. So this is where you can start listening in the probably the last five minutes. Just delete that from your memory. <laughs> you, you won't ever get that time back again. Um, so, But listen to this. So this is by Gavin McGrath. So Gavin McGrath is an expert in the Texas Receptus, expert in Byzantine manuscripts, lives here in Australia. He's a fellow Australian, lives in my state. So... The first issue he's looking at, take heed that ye. Textus Receptus and Authorised Version. So the preliminary textual discussion. The scribe of lectionary 2378 first wrote out the reading of Matthew 6, 1 to 13 
and then the reading of Matthew 6, 15 to 21. Therefore, before giving a combined reading from Mark 11, 22 to 26 and Matthew 7, 7 to 8, he gives rubric in which he first refers to the opening words of Matthew 6, 1 to 13. Um, prosecte. So this is in the phonetic Greek. I can never read phonetic um, when it's in English words. <laughs> I can never read it properly. If it's in Greek, I can actually pronounce it. Um, prosecte. What's the actual Greek say? Anyway, take heed that ye and Eli Musin, Eli Musunin, arms. Okay. So see commentary at Matthew 6 1b infra. So that looks more like the issue that we're dealing with there, the arms issue. So let's go down here to that issue. The scribe, oh, yes, yeah, so I just read that. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, at, at Matthew 6 1b, the TR's Greek, Eli Masunin arms or charitable deeds. New King James, in the words, take heed that you do not do your arms, Eli Mosunan, before men, authorised version, is supported by the majority Byzantine text, for example, W032, 5th century, which is Byzantine in Matthew 1 uh, to 28, Luke 8, uh, 13 to 24, 53, it's in Sigma, um, 042, late 5th century, 6th century. Lectionaries, 2378, 11th century, twice in two different readings. And uh, 1968, uh, 1544 AD it is also supported by the old Latin versions. K, 4th and 5th centuries Latin. Elimusunem, which is a little bit different. Oh, no, that's the Latin of it. And F. 6th century Latin, Elimusunem. It is further supported by the ancient Greek, ancient church Greek writer Chrysostom, who died in 407. Moreover, the reading righteousness, Greek, Dikaiosunen, Latin, just, Justitium, thus making the reading, take heed that you do not do your righteousness before men. So that's the American Standard Version. So that's the difference here. The King James says your charitable deeds or your arms, do not do your arms before men. New King James says charitable deeds um, where the American Standard Version has your righteousness. Okay. So it's found in Jerome's Latin Vulgate, 5th century, Old Latin Versions, a 4th century, uh, sorry, A, 4th century, B, 5th century, D, 5th century, H, 5th century, Q, 6th and 7th century, AUR, 7th century, 1, 7th and 8th century, G1, 8th and 9th century, FF1, 10th, 11th century, and C, 12th, 13th century, as well as the Sengalensis, Latin diatessaron, 9th century. From the Latin support for all this reading, it is manifested in the Clementine Vulgate of 1592. It is also followed by the ancient church writer Origen, who died in 254. The Latin church writers such as Hilary died in 367, Augustine, um, for, who died in 430, and the medieval church Latin writer Gregory the Great, uh, who died in 604. There is no good textual reason to doubt the representative Byzantine text, which must therefore stand as the correct reading. In the context of Matthew 6, 1 to 4, the same Greek word, Eli Masune, is found three other times, once in each of the successive three verses. This clearly shows that contextually Christ is discussing arms. 
the particular influence of Matthew 632 is a source for assimilations with Matthew 5 47 and 48 um, it has been noted in the commentary uh, supra seemingly the connected subsequent verse but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness the Kai de Kai Sunan, Matthew 633 also formed part of the expansive influence by assimilation of the teaching in Matthew 6 32 and 33 if deliberate such stylistic improvements cannot be undertaken without arrogance and impiety but was this alteration actually accidental was the copyist page reading elamusin arms damaged either by paper loss or some substantive split over it so that only the last six letters were visible that is osuni then because the missing five letters of alim in elim osuni would make up the same space as the five letters of dikai in dikai sunan to describe reconstruct this as Dikai Asun and righteousness after reading Matthew 6.33 and wrongly concluding that this same word should be supplied at Matthew 6.1b. Whether this change from arms, Elima Sunan, to righteousness, Dikai Sunan, was deliberate or accidental, it is a matter lost in the unwritten pages of unrecorded history, but that such a change did occur is clearly um, evident. On the one hand, the TR reading uh, arms, Elimusunan, is supported by the representative Byzantine text, some old Latin versions and an ancient church writer. It poses no textual um, problems and so must stand as correct. But on the other hand, the variant reading righteousness, Dikaiosunan, has the support of Jerome's Latin Vulgate and a number of old Latin versions and a number of ancient church, church writers. Taking into account these competing considerations on the system of rating textual readings A to E, so he's doing his own textual commentary, so he rates the text, the TR readings. I would give the TR readings arms in Matthew 6 1 B a B. Uh, that is, the text of the TR is the correct reading and has a um, uh, middling level of certainty. Textual history outside the closed class of three witnesses. So um, in this type of language, the closed class of witnesses, he's looking at the Greek, he's lo looking at the Latin, and he's looking at the early church writers. That's the three in the closed class of witnesses. Outside of the closed class of witnesses are things like Syriac, Coptic, Arabic, Ethiopic, and all that sort of stuff, Gothic. So outside of the closed class of sources, the correct reading at Matthew um, 6 1 B arms is found in the mixed text type Codex L uh, 09 19, 8th century, and the independent Codex Z um, 035 6th century. It is further found in the celebrated Syriac Peshito, first half of the 5th century, the Harclean H 616. Uh, versions as well as the Coptic Middle Egyptian version, 3rd century, Gothic version, 4th century, Armenian version, 5th century, in Siasas, Latin, Arabic, Diatessaron, Arabic, 12th to 14th centuries, Latin, 19th century, as Latin, Elimosinum, Elimosinum arms. The incorrect reading of Matthew 6 1 righteousness. Dikai Sunan is also found in the two leading Alexandrian texts. Rome, Vaticanus, uh, 4th century, and London, Sinaiticus, 4th century, uh, together with the leading representative of the Western text, Codex D05, 5th century, it entered into the Neo Alexandrian and New Text et al. It is found at Matthew 6, 1 in the ASV is take heed that you do not do your righteousness before men. It was also followed by the RSV, the NRSV, as beware of practicing your piety 
new revised standard version, as well as the ESV, the NASB, and the NIV. However, in the NIV's um, looseness of unwarranted dynamic equivalence, righteousness, Dikai Sunan, American Standard Version becomes acts of righteousness. Uh, Dikai Sunan is the same word, uh, NIV. On this occasion, probably influenced by the Syriac, Moffat has the correct reading for the wrong reasons. Take care not to practice your charity, um, Elima Sunan, before men. And so this is in Gavin McGrath's books. So I will put that link there and you can look for yourself at that information. So that's the case made for that. So, um, yeah, so there is acknowledged, there is a difference. Uh, Scribner made a difference and um, he didn't mention it in his 190 variations. But we're going to continue to study through that issue um, and go through it. Um, but let's go back to the video. Found to be kind of surprising. Yeah, the the Complutensian polyglot is it's well known that it does not include the doxology to the Lord's Prayer. Okay. But what's interesting, I never knew this, is it gives a, a, a footnote in the margin about why. And the reason why, and again, I had to, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, a Latin scholar by any stretch, so I had to do some research and work on this. But as best I understood, the reason that they claim that it should not be included is that it's likely, and they use the the understanding of internal evidence, that it's a reading that was inserted because its use was liturgical, and because it became so part of the liturgical uh, rest of the Lord's Prayer that scribes just assumed it should be part of the Lord's Prayer and therefore they started adding it. And so the Complutensian Polyglot does not use the, the doxology to the Lord's Prayer. And while, while most of us know that, their reasoning for rejecting it is really interesting because that sounds like how we do modern textual criticism. Right. They have a, a harder reading or they have a shorter reading or they have a... Uh, um, uh, uh, they just have internal evidence to reject it, and that's what they leaned mm. upon. So I thought that was pretty interesting as well. That okay. in their in their margin, they were they were talking about better readings and worse readings and so forth. Right, right. Well, that's cool. So now, now if I'm a confessional bibliology, I'm just going to put on the CB hat for a moment, and I hear you talking about. So he was just talking about the Complutensian polyglot. How many of you guys? Uh, like, oh, let's go to the Complutensian Polyglot and get our readings. Probably none of you. <laughs> now, if you're doing a study into TR editions and where things started from and all the rest of it, yeah, you would do that if you were doing articles on the Texas Receptus. Um, it, like if you were writing about the history of aviation, you'd go back to the Wright brothers, you know. Um, but how many people are using that plane nowadays? No one. Um, how many people are using Complutensian Polyglot, the five editions of Erasmus? <clears throat> we are using either the text of Visa or the Scrivener text, or we're just using the King James and saying it's the underlying Greek text of the King James. Pretty much that's what we're doing. So why go to the Complutensian Polyglot? You know, um, are we going to Luckman? to disprove the critical text? Should we go to Luckman and hold these guys accountable for Luckman's choices? I think it was based on like two manuscripts or three manuscripts or something. Should we go to that and, and say, well, you know, Timothy Deco, you, you're, well, he's actually a Byzantine guy, so, but, you know, should we hold Elijah Hickson over the coals and say, well, um, why, why do you support, you know, do you realise there's a difference between Luckman's text and the NA28, you know, or the Luckman's text and Westcott and Hort? Or, he would just go, well, what's Luckman got to do with anything, any choice? If he was pointing to say his text is the NA28, why would Luckman really mean anything, you know, in that argument? Um, so anyway about this and and uh sharing all of the textual variants in here 
Uh, I'm I'm not convinced, right? And the reason why I wouldn't be convinced as a confessional bibliologist, I'm not a confessional bibliologist. I'm just I'm just trying to come from it from that angle. I would say some of these variants, um, like the one you mentioned between righteous works and charity, um, they made their way down the line through Stephanus and and Beza and Elsevier, uh, and it, and, it, and then ends up in our King James Bible. So these readings must have been relatively easy. Uh, for us through the textual text text through the received text tradition for us to pick out um so how how would you suggest like, like what would you think of an argument such as that i guess you know my, my point is not, is not necessarily to convince mm -hmm. a confessional bibliologist away from his textus receptus tradition mm -hmm. but it's just be fair i mean the the same measure that you measure against others you need to measure against yourself Right, and so um, with so this is the sin that apparently we're doing. We're not measuring um, people properly. We should be measuring ourselves. It's, uh, I, I just, for the life of me, can't understand why going back to a whole bunch of older TR editions, um, late, you know, just labeled TR, that there was no critical text in the reform period, zero printed critical text editions. Like, obviously, we call, you know, Erasmus and Beza and stuff. We call these people, you know, text critics because, you know, it's not being critical of the text, you know. But there was no critical text, what is labelled critical text today, like a Westcott and Hall type text. But a chemist was ignored. Erasmus looked at it, said no, nah, and he ignored it. And it was ignored for hundreds of years. And so where was their, t their text just didn't exist. So, so they're actually, it's a bit like saying, well, all of Christianity, all of Protestant Christianity of that era is, um, you know, we're, we're looking at it all. It's all labeled the Reformation, say, for example. And then we're going, oh, well, some of the ref reformers like Wycliffe, he was a Catholic, you know, um, Tyndale was a Catholic, you know, Martin Luther, he was a Catholic and, and then he left. But, you know, Erasmus, he was a Catholic, you know, and just sort of putting a, an umbrella over everyone where all, all these people are different. Like some people were reformed to the back teeth. Some people were reformed slightly. Um, like, look at the Church of England. They basically just sort of changed all the Catholic churches to be Protestant churches all of a sudden and just, you know, made the Great Bible chained to the pulpit. And it's like, okay, we're Protestants now. We're sort of like Lutherans almost, you know. Um, but there was still a lot of ritual. There was a lot of... Um, you know, you know what I'm saying. That there were Puritans. You can't just label everyone as the same thing. And so, um, there were different editions of the text. You can't just say, "Well, they're all got the TR label on it." So we all we have to accept them. If we say, "Hey, I've got my TR or whatever," you can't say, "Well, this thing's called a TR as well." Like, I've got a Boeing seven four seven. Well, I'm, there's this other thing called an aeroplane. And let's go back in time. Oh, the Wright brothers. So you, do you support the Wright brothers' plane? Will you fly in that? Will you put your family in that? It's like, um, I'm not talking about that. And it's, it just seems like the this argument is, it's so silly that it's actually hard to bring up parallel examples to talk about it because it's so silly. Like I'm talking about the iPhone and planes and it's, it's it's silly argumentation but apparently we've got to feel guilty about this and we're not judging them properly apparently somewhere somehow um how exactly i don't know um i mean when we look at the the abomination of, of even Dwayne green would agree that the critical text is a mess um but this guy you know seems to be a Byzantine guy as well. So he's you know more of a Maurice Robinson sort of Byzantine guy, apparently. But um you know, 
anyway, it, it just seems like a strange concept. And this is the sort of sort of drivel that we go on with uh, when we're dealing with the textual confidence collective. They just bring up these straw man arguments. It's a bit like James White saying, do you realize that Erasmus and Beza did textual criticism? And you're sort of like, oh, what are you talking about? You know, it's they obviously aren't doing modern textual criticism based upon Vaticanus and Sinaiticus primacy, are they? Because they rejected Vaticanus and Sinaiticus wasn't there. So, so it, it is different in that sense because it's like they're the main focus. They're the cornerstone for their modern Bibles and they're not for the TR. So that, that's a huge difference in itself. The focus is not on them. And also you can't say that the post-Enlightenment um, text criticism is the same as what Erasmus did. It's the same as what Stefano said there would be similarities anyone doing any type of um, work art science yes there would be similarities in someone doing putting up signs and posters around town as for a job there would be similarities be between him and what picasso did for example but there's there's huge differences and so that yes there are similarities you can say, well, they're both beautifying things. They're both using color. Yes, they both have to, have to think about what they're doing beforehand. They have to, you know, sketch out it, you know, draft before they do their thing. But would you say it's just exactly the same? No. It, and like James White's just like, they were doing textual criticism, like as if it's like a gotcha moment. We're like, yeah, but they were doing biblical textual criticism in a sense where they believe the bible was preserved they believe that they could find the final text people today most of the academy are saying we can't find the final text it's just going to be an ongoing thing to have text critics yeah constantly trying to find the like you'd think with modern technology surely they could find this text but you know in the reformation we found it and so it was it was from one technology manuscripts it, it was brought into print so print is a, a hugely different technology because you can just you can fine tune one thing and print it 10,000 times you know so it's it's a completely different technology but it was all the problems were ironed out by the time we got to the 1611 the final edition of the Texas Receptus and so um, Helg says, I plead innocent on all charges. No, Helg, you have to wear the collective guilt of the Trinitarian Bible Society and what they wrote in some article in uh, 1997. But they didn't word it properly. And they basically are saying all TR editions are, are the same, so apparently. Uh, they're all very much the same. And there's hardly any differences, even though the Comiohanium, everyone knows the Comiohanium in the first two editions. It's like, I mean, just look at the Complutensian Polyglot. Do a study between the Complutensian Polyglot and and the King James. You go, oh, heaps of differences, you know. Between that and Scrivener, heaps of differences. Um, history document says their argument is so nonsensical, it's actually hard to find examples to describe it. Yeah, and that's what I find when I'm doing Mark Ward videos and I'm I'm sort of there umming and ahhing because it's like, can I find an example even in politics or a, a work example? I can't. I have, I have to make up like the iPhone examples and the, the plane examples because, I mean, you know, say for example... Um, like the Rosetta Stone. Now, when they found that, they couldn't transcribe it, but eventually they got to the point where they transcribed all, I think it was Coptic or something, or no, the hieroglyphs, sorry. So they got to the stage where they could transcribe the whole thing. Now, if someone came along and just started redefining things and saying, oh, no, that eagle actually means something else, well, they're actually, they're taking away from that work. So the King James translators, they went from one technology to the next, from manuscripts to printing. 
So the reformers went through all these editions of the TR. King James translators, they worked on that text. It was primarily Beza's text, but they fixed it up. Okay. And that became its own TR edition. Now, that is going from one technology to another. And so we can't... Um, I sort of lost my train of thought because because the examples are so lame. I'm just trying to think of a good example. <sighs> yeah, well, I, I was talking about the Rosetta Stone. Well, but it's like they're actually just sort of changing information on the stone, and um, it's not even. I can't even think of a, an example that that is this silly. Um, as I was reading before. The, probably the best example is the iPhone or you know, Boeing 747, you know, and them bringing up the, the B-52 bomber. You know, do you realize that it had problems and it used to conk out mid-flight and blah, blah. It's like, okay, um, what's that got to do with us? <laughs> you know, um, it's sort of like, you know, we're holding a board meeting and talking about things and someone walks in with an iPhone 2 or 3 and goes, see... You guys are promoting the, the iPhone. It's like, yeah, it might be called an iPhone, but we're specifically talking about this other thing. You know, do we have to agree with everything that ever happened? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just silly. It's just, just nonsensical. With all of these variations, you need to at least be willing to say that your tradition is not as stable when you lean on preservation or, or when you... What, our tradition is not stable. We go with the printed text, and they were still looking at manuscripts. So Stephanus in 1550, it's not like he was like, we've just got the text and that's it. No, he was looking at manuscripts. He was looking at the Complutense. He was looking at everything that he had. So obviously he's continuing a work. Beza did the same. He was looking, many times he's looking at, um, Syriac documents, looking at the work of um, Yanius, Tremelius, looking at other manuscripts that he had and amending the text accordingly. So are these guys just going, that's my text, that's it? And is, because the thing is, they're not acknowledging that printing and man manuscripts just didn't just all explode and disappear as soon as printing came. Printing came along and manuscripts were the vast majority of what people had. So printing came along and people had print and manuscripts. So you can grab the the Bible the, you know the the Bible that you've got 1550 and you've got you know foot, footnotes and marginal notes in that and you can still read the manuscripts. So that's what Beza was doing. He's looking at and hang on, what about this? What about that? And got to the point where he perfected right up to a certain degree. And the King James translators just sort of put their little dash of seasoning on it. And it was perfect. Um, Helg says, we don't go back to a 1984 computer without the internet and Google. Yeah. <laughs> um, we... See, the thing is, I've often said, if you actually got a Muslim back in, you know, 15, 16, and he went and grabbed, you know, 20 manuscripts and made a Bible, it would be labelled a Texas Receptus Bible, wouldn't it? Because pretty much a Byzantine type of thing, they're all pretty much very similar. And so it would be labelled TR. So that would be another one that we have to feel bad about. You know, Erasmus, yes, he had a lot of problems, but he had a lot going for him as well. And so, yes, he was probably deeply compromised with the Roman Catholic Church. But what about Luther? You know, if Luther had done all that work, would we just go, yay? It's sort of weird. Luther, Luther is a weird... Um, person in a sense where it's sort of like, yeah, Luther started this whole thing, but um, let's not mention him again. <laughs> let's let's just be quiet about Luther. You know, you sort of sense that in Reformation literature, 
you, you the other people just sort of took his place and and you know but you know he was the main pioneer guy you know it's a bit like um you know someone causing a revolution or something like that and a new government's in it's like well don't mention the rebels you know just they're they're at the door but i mean tyndale was a roman catholic right up until the day he died and they defrocked him from being a priest but he never had left the church i mean sometimes it can just be labels i mean the whole of europe was roman catholic the whole of europe and then you just had this new movement growing and what's amazing is tyndale he just translated erasmus's greek text into english a few of his books into english and english had a reformation <laughs> the english people had a reformation and um so that was coming from erasmus but then erasmus compromises in these other areas luther still held on to some weird things yes he did some great things but he had some weird things and so um yeah erasmus is a multi-faceted person you can't just say well he's in this camp he's in that camp he's here he's there it wasn't like there was just this church you could join you know and, and the, the lutherans weren't really getting a great name around europe they were they were sort of blamed for um you know some things that had happened and you know luther had called upon um you know the princes to do things and you know if you've watched the luther movie or you know listen to the audio books on, on luther um it was a bit of a stigma that um you know, luther felt like he had blood on his hands because he was calling for the authorities to do things and basically it, they they raised hell and so i mean imagine your pastor feeling like he's guilty of bloodshed and it's 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 a strange weird time there's politics involved there's a whole bunch of stuff but at the end of the day like i said even a muslim could have gotten the greek manuscripts and it would have been considered a tr edition and so it, jeff riddle trinitarian bible society they are pretty much saying that it was from the 1550 through Beza, um, who were all basically in Geneva. That's where the Protestants were. That's where the Bible came from. Okay. So earlier editions, whether it's Erasmus or whether it's a, a Greek Orthodox priest. So this is the thing. These guys are both Byzantine priority. They have to go with the readings and choices of Greek Orthodox priests what's the diff between that and erasmus you know what I mean? you know what i mean oh but they're greek they, that's good you know well, erasmus did greek as well so but you know that's different because tr bad our text good you know when someone on our side whatever that side is yeah. says um you know no doctrine is affected by the variance and the confessional bibliologist replies well, what about the doctrine of bibliology right i want to then say that goes with you as well because right. if you're arguing for you know a an absolute an absolutism for the text then you the absolutism so that's the the textual confidence collective type of words where textual absolutists where we're advocating for absolutism so that comes from Mark Ward. You now have to give an account for these these jots and tittles. And the but why do we have to give an account for the Wright brothers when we're not talking about them? Why? <laughs> why? Why? It's it, you're not making any sense. These are more than just jots and tittles, right? And so I want to hold you to the same standard, and you need to be willing to own that. I think, and so it's not necessarily uh, to to dissuade a notice. It's the Elijah Hicks and stuff's going to start coming out. You're, you're a bit of a liar. You're dishonest. You got to be honest, you know, and admit that, you know, you're saying you like the iPhone 14, 15 or whatever is out now. You have to admit that the iPhone three had problems. If you don't admit that you're dishonest. It's like, what? The Texas receptus proponent is just to be, you know honest with the evidence i, I just be honest with the evidence 
be honest, you know, fair enough. If he wants to say Trinitarian Bible Society wrote this, I read it this way, I don't think it's good. Okay, that's fine. Um, how many other people are saying that? He's pointed to Jeff Riddle. Okay. Um, I'm not saying it. I don't know anyone else who's really saying that. Um, but in a general sense, like I said about the English Bibles, I would say, yeah, King James, Geneva, Bishops, substantially the same text. <laughs> you know what I mean? In comparison to the NIV. So it just depends on the context. I think that's the major issue that those articles, you know, by uh, Trinitarian Bible Society, whether they were purposely dishonest or just misleading on accident, it, that, that exposes that th th those claims are not accurate. And it's okay. Yeah, that's fine. You right. just need to make sure that you own that and are aware of that. And so I would just hold, hold yourself to the same standard that you hold us and uh, we'll be good. So what standard are we holding you to? Um, you know, the same standard. Uh, well, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we are getting called Ruckmanites by Mark Ward. We're getting told we're in a cult that we are not really true Christians. He might say, oh, my brother's in the King James only movement, but he's saying we're in a cult, um, you know, and Mark Ward's being charitable, you know, to, to keep people coming back. The, the vast majority of people online, they're just like, ah, oh, King James, uh, they just, someone will say something about Sam, what Sam Gipp said, and they label everyone who holds a King James, who, Re, you know, follows the T up. We're all like that. It, it's you know, holding people to the same standard. I mean, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt because you're saying you're Byzantine, whatever. But at the end of the day, um, you know, where's, where's your definitive text? Do you have the, a def definitive text? Where has that been translated into languages of the world? Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all nations. Where's that happening with your text? Why are you guys still following the Texas Receptus in the New King James? Even though it does depart from the TR in some places, it's like it's still primarily a TR edition. Um, yeah, but he's basically saying that we're not being honest with uh variants that when we say that there are issues in bibliology we're not talking about the right brothers plane we're talking about the boeing 747 we're not talking about the iphone 3 we're talking about the latest iphone and so why are you bringing these things up yeah, oh, you know and the thing was, in the Textual Confidence Collective, it was like, well, Westcott and Hort, you know, people are still saying that we're following Westcott and Hort's text. It's just not true. And then you read all the main proponents, Metzger and Ayland, and they're like, well, what we did is we sort of scrapped everything and just got Westcott and Hort text, and we added and subtracted accordingly as we felt um, the evidence pointed. So they actually, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter about all the earlier uh, Nestle editions or or the um, um, Ayland Nestle Alan editions. They just went with, um, they basically, basically when the United Bible Society uh, text, when they came on board, they went back to Westcott and Hort again and formulated a new text. <laughs> and so, with, uh, you know, so they are going back to Westcott and Hort. Now, if, if I read that Stephanus had just gone only gone back to Erasmus or Beza said, I only just, I, I just skipped everything and went back to the Complutensian polyglot, well, then it would be, yeah, well, we would go back and look at that and differences. But it's like, yeah, you know, they're saying we distance ourselves from Westcott and Hort. Um, but the people who actually worked on the text aren't, they're saying we've gotten closer to Westcott and Hort. 
Um, yeah, anyway. Right, right. Now, when you come back, so again, with my TR hat on, <laughs> put See, many hats on. I think the thing is, Wayne Green actually knows the position of the confessional bibliology guys. And he also knows the position of people like myself and who are on Facebook and and so I can see him just looking at it going, well, it's not really making that much sense, you know, like trying to make us feel guilty about something or, you know, we've got to hold, we've got to have the same standards. It's like, okay, okay so how have we been not having good standards? You know, we're, we're saying, what about the doctrine of bibliology? Um, well, clearly, if you have a text that can just change at a whim, you know, a Westcott and Hort style, you know, you just delete 12 verses here, 12 verses here, you know, you basically they're saying any type of um, emendation to the text is equivalent to what Westcott and Hort did. So, you know, if, if Erasmus changed something, if Beza changed something, well, that's exactly the same as what they're doing today, but it's not. There's a difference between moving towards something and moving away from something. If you're moving and changing and adapting, you're, you're overcoming, you're adapting, you're improvising, you're going toward a truth, that's different than moving away from truth and bringing in contradiction. Like, say, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have their Bible. Have they moved from truth? They have. Now, I can prove that the critical text is even Dwayne Green. Green I, I, I called him Gwayne Dwayne. Um, Dwayne Green would agree that the critical text is a mess. And so it's there's so many errors in this text that weren't in there before. So the textus receptus is stable, and then it, all these a strange and weird bizarre readings have entered in and we can prove that i'll debate anyone i'll debate timothy decker Dwayne green can you know support him i'll debate peter gurry i'll debate um, peter mead i'll debate anyone elijah hickson on this that their text is now filled with contradictions filled with historical errors filled with genealogical um, lists that don't make sense, that have the wrong people in it, filled with the wrong um, geography, Jesus going to the wrong place, um, all sorts of strange things. Jesus being a sinner, Matthew chapter 5, if you're angry without a cause, I mean, even these guys will support that reading. It's a Byzantine reading, you know. So, so when it comes to your category one, you know, major very So this is uh, Dwayne Green basically having some, you know, putting his TR hat on. So I'll let this run because he does make some interesting um, points. I think I even saw some pushback on that on, on a couple of Facebook comments suggesting, well, your category one variants are actually fairly weak. And, and uh, although they represent a translatable difference, their meaning is actually essentially the same. Um, so how, how would you defend uh, a category one reading? Like, could, could you give us an example? Well, the Lord's Prayer being one of those, you know, a yeah. lot of people would say that changing the pronouns that happens, you know, mm. typically it's just one letter difference and they often sound the same. Okay, fine. But like I said, when it comes into quotable portions like the Lord's Prayer, to hear it as your father who is in heaven, that... Like... <laughs> Like to me, like I said earlier, um, I, I've got nothing against Timothy Decker, but he's saying quite illiterate things, like no one in their right mind. So I shouldn't say no one in their right mind because it's not about your, your, your mental capabilities, but no one with the right amount of education would come to the conclusion that Beza was saying, your father which art in heaven. It's obviously a typographical error, very common um, between those two words, between our and your in the Greek. So he's saying this is like a gotcha thing. 
um, it's just a nothing. It's, it, it means absolutely nothing. And to say, it like, <laughs> it's almost like he feels like he's discovered this. Your father, which I, I wonder how many other people he's told. I would be embarrassed to be making these type of claims publicly. I know I might say some um, silly things uh, online. I usually do my things live, so I can't edit things out. But, um, yeah, this is... This is down there with just sort of like, <laughs> you know, no one noticed this sort of thing. It says your father, which I never, and it's like, uh, doesn't say that. Just look at his Latin, pater noster, our father. That becomes pretty noticeable. Right. Um, but some that are harder to observe, but if you're, if you're, if you're, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm being a grammarian here. But simple omissions of uh, of the article or or change in the article, uh, for example, let me let me find a place where this this comes up could change how, how the grammar is understood. So let's see if I can find um, a verse. Yeah. So when it speaks of our Father who is in secret, and it's multiple times in in chapter six. By the way, that's also done in threes. Anyways. Right. Um, okay. Uh, when you change where that article is located. Uh, or you remove that article in general. That that article is in front of a prepositional phrase. Prepositional yep. phrases don't normally have an article. What what that article does? Right. It's not a definite article. There is no such thing mm -hmm. as a Greek definite article mm -hmm. because that would imply that there's an indefinite article and there's not. What that article does in front of a preposition is turns that preposition into some kind of substantive or adjective. In other words, right. it takes on it, it forces that preposition <laughs> to take on properties. In this case, of an adjective. You leave mm -hmm. that article off, prepositions are normally adverbial. Prepositions are usually answering questions of who, where, why, when, how. So yep. in secret is saying where, unless it's turned with an article into an adjective and saying now it's describing our father who is in secret versus uh, if the article is absent and some, uh, some TR editions uh, omit the article, now the reading would change, the understanding would change to... Uh, the father sees in secret. Now, mm -hmm. again, that's minor in terms of, you know, someone may or may not see that in the translation. That is a translatable difference, but that is a huge interpretive difference because right. he, he is making a point about what you can see versus what you cannot see. And it's not right. the action who sees or how he sees it, but the, the one who sees. That's pretty big. Yeah. And so yeah. if you're going to, if you're going to argue, you over well yeah that's just an article being omitted that's insignificant i get that and i didn't do that for every omission right some omissions are less significant than others but those times where it does affect the grammar the grammar affects the meaning the meaning affects the translation and, and, and translation affects the interpretation yeah i added that to category one so right. there might be some who dispute that and that's fine um sure. but uh hmm. the, even even if you don't like my category one uh, terminology that's fine but taking all of those 32 that i that i uh that i have there do those fit with how uh, i think it was anderson and anderson and then the the trinitarian bible society those two articles does that data fit what they said about the Textus receptus you know put the right. nomenclature aside does it fit it just i don't hmm. think it does i don't right. think it does. so get right. rid of the nomenclature just look at the evidence uh, I just did the categories just because it, I, I needed to be organized. And, of course, I did it in threes because it's the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, one one more TR hat question, then I'll take the TR hat. Okay, so Helg says, <clears throat> even accounting the differences between all TR editions is like a 99.9% .9 text compared to those uh, critical text fans who fumble around the 94% text and even majority text, which is much lower than 99. Yeah, I think the majority text is like 98%. Um, the TR editions together are at least much nearer to a consistent preserved text. There is a world of difference between all TRs and the critical text apparatus, and even um, better, uh, Byzantine text and split or even between Byzantine text and split majority. Um, this would represent Edward Hill's position. 
Yeah, and I guess most people only really bring up like Erasmus, Complutense, and Polyglot, and other earlier editions when they're sort of put on the spot and go when they're asked, "What do you think about those editions?" It's like, well, yeah, I, I mean they're good, you know. It's it's like, what do you think of the Wright brothers? Oh, yeah, mate, good job, mate. They got up in the air. Uh, they worked really hard. Um, yeah, it must have been hard work. You know, yeah, they were very smart guys. Um, you know what I mean? What about the iPhone 3? Yeah, it was great. I can't even remember it. Oh, hang on. <laughs> you know, most people, how many people have even looked at the Complutense in Polyglot? <laughs> and I find most of these critical text guys, um, yeah, I'm not saying Timothy Decker is a critical text guy, but uh, they have this sort of rumor that, you know, that you had to rush to print to beat the Complutensian guys. Well, the Complutensian guys have actually had, they actually printed their text in 1514. Now it had um, it had the New Testament in it, but it also had a Hebrew dictionary in it for the Old Testament portion that they hadn't made yet. So after a few years, they made that. Then they were able to bring these two out together. And so, um, yeah, there's this sort of thing where oh, Rasmus just beat them and all the, all the rest of it. Um, at the end of the day, the Complutensian Polyglot, they printed like 600 of them. It was mostly just a scholarly endeavor. It wasn't going to be like the popular Bible like Erasmus's was. It was a scholarly endeavor. It was a polyglot edition, you know, hugely clunky with dictionaries in it and synonyms and all sorts of things and so um it seems like a lot of critical text guys don't really know much about the complexity and polyglot um but anyway at off all right hard hard question incoming all right so we're we're talking about uh textual variants between tr editions that are rather rather um major in in their in the way they impact the meaning of of a passage um so by suggesting that there are are these issues between TR editions, what does that say about the critical edition and some of the issues there? So are you willing to say that, yes, there are these category one issues that are rather significant uh, in the TR tradition, and then also say that there are these category one uh, variants within the critical text edition? Are you, are you prepared to go both ways with that? Sure. I, I, I think that's the interesting thing here, that those who would use the critical text and by the way i'm not a critical text proponent either i have a very good. nuanced methodology in my textual criticism but good good i'll ask you about that later yeah. okay <laughs> <clears throat> um but what what i would say is that we we've we've not had a problem saying that for a while we we readily acknowledge gathering all the data there are some significant and and more significant than the tr variants I, i'm fine with that. Hmm. that that is okay um, but like I said, I just want you to, I want the, the confessional bibliologist or whatever term they're going to use, I want them to be held to that same standard. Who's not acknowledged? Like, <laughs> Jeff Riddle's written articles on Erasmus's first two editions, didn't have the Comiohenium in it. He's done whole sermons on this issue, you know, clearing up, you know, because people, you hold holding to task and say where where was the bible before 1611 or where was the bible before stephanus where was the bible but you know just if you've ever, ever watched the um jeff riddle against uh peter gurry and uh james snap jr um sort of like debate thing that was on um uh that was on the internet quite a few years ago you just see they just hate the whole concept of kept pure in all ages and they redefine that term create a straw man and then tear the straw man down where Jeff Riddle is very nuanced in what he says. He's very careful in what he says. And so um, it just seems like these guys are trying to get them on a technicality. Like, gotcha. You know, we, we found this in the Trinitarian Bible Society article. Ha ha. Look. <laughs> and um, yeah, even Jeff Riddle would just say, yeah, first two editions of Erasmus, yeah, there's differences. He he will, if, if you just jump on his website, let's, uh, I think it's Stylos. Hmm. 
Oops. Oh, Jeff Riddle. <clears throat> Here we go. Okay, so let's go a few years back. 2016. Okay. I'm just looking for something on textual criticism. Because usually he's mentioning you know Erasmus, Visa. Yeah, he did a whole article on the text that Calvin used and how he was using the Colonnaeus text, but then eventually he moved to a more stable, you know, um, Stephanus sort of text or something like that. Um, he did a whole article on it. You know, so so what's he not acknowledging? What what does he have to? What, what's he apologising for? <sighs> okay. So anyway, I'm just sort of fishing for bits and pieces. It's nearly finished. Let's continue. That we're going to argue that because we have these cat like legitimate category one variants in our Bibles, um, we're not we're not going to shy away from that reality. And we're going to still understand that they don't, they don't address, you know, they don't um, conflict with any major doctrines, and um, and even the doctrine of bibliology, I don't think is affected by that because I would say that uh, preservation goes not to the final edition but to the manuscript tradition, and so mm -hmm. preservation and bibliology has been preserved. What is written is there in the. She's like preservation is not with the final edition. Well, when you're going from one technology to another like printing um you can create a final edition you can look at all the manuscripts and go well that's the isn't that what these guys would be trying to do with the byzantine text like trying to get to the point where it's like that's it that's the reading or else how could you have confidence in any of the words if they could all just change like you know there's 2900 less words from the the texas receptus um in the nestle alarm text okay there's eight thousand changes so who's to say if they find another sinaiticus of vaticanus find you know uh tomorrow there's going to be another um you know two th th another three thousand deleted words uh maybe they'll add 500 you know maybe they'll they'll change you know another eight thousand that'll be sixteen thousand <clears throat> who's to say that that couldn't happen well the thing is you know, when you look at these texts, it's these are print editions, attempts to try and show you what the manuscripts say. And sometimes, too, it's like, say, the example of the Rosetta Stone. <clears throat> you can have something there for quite a while that hasn't been figured out yet. And then finally someone figures it out. And they, they nail it. And you don't what work done and so Beza nailed it king james translators nailed it that's it work done shake the dust off your hands work's done there we go we've 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 gone from the manuscript technology to print there we go we've got all the words of god between two covers in one book and so the greek manuscripts and the hebrew manuscripts and all that um so I, I i don't have a problem admitting category one variants what i want is for the confessional bibliologist the texas receptus advocate the king james only ist to also admit honestly that your tradition has variants major variants and our tradition we've got to admit it so let me see a show of hands Put your hand up if you didn't know that Erasmus deleted the Commiohanium from the first two editions. I don't see any hands going up. You know what I mean? It's like, what's he trying? Why is he trying to make us all feel bad 
about stuff that I mean. <laughs> look, look, look at this article that I'm, I'm working on. The 190 list. This is the differences between just Scrivener and Beza. And um, <clears throat> let's have a look where all the pictures are. Looks pretty ugly without pictures. Okay, like this one. Okay, I'm showing the Scrivener edition. I'm showing the Beza edition. Yeah, I haven't filled in all the issues yet, but most of the time that's because Beza just says, uh, sorry, Beza. Scrivener just says Beza. Um, Kateri Omnes, which means all editions. So I'm like, mm, do I have to look them all up? You know, it takes a while to look all these up, you know. But I'm putting, you know, the the nuts and bolts there, the the, the editions, you know. So you can see there's no no change, no change. But then all of a sudden Scribner's going, no, we have to have that in there. And it's following the competency in polyglot. But then we're looking at all the English editions and we're checking that out. And um, showing where, yeah, Scrivener has changed this issue and why he changed it for no apparent reason. So is that like not, not am I guilty of not acknowledging that there's differences? I'm actually spending the vast majority of my study looking at the differences. So I just, I, I watch a video like this and I'm just like, you know, like, it's Twilight Zone. It's, I, I can't even put this, put it into words. Like, because I don't, you know, who, who else is, Jeff Riddle does this type of study. Yeah, when he was looking at Revelation 16.5, he was going through Erasmus, going through Stephanus, going through... Visa, he's like, ah, oh, there's the change. You know, he's going through all that. Um, he's translating the annotations, recognizing differences. And so we've got to feel guilt, guilty for not recognizing differences, but we are recognizing differences. So you're condemning the guiltless you're making us guilty for something that we have, haven't done. Why? <laughs> why? Oh, why? Oh, why? Helg says, Mark Ward has for a long time tried to hold Jeff Riddle to the same standard, the which TR question, but unfortunately Jeff Riddle has declined to play in the game after Mark Ward's rules. Yeah, the which TR question, it's like... Um, uh, but one thing is, I I think there can be some people don't want to go. It's the underlying text of the King James because they're afraid of the scarecrow term King James only. And but at the end of the day, I mean, you look at you know, the Scrivener that they're saying that they follow, and it just says the Greek text underlying the authorized version. That's in the front of the Greek text, okay, of 1611. So, so you're tied to the 1611, whether it's this, whether it's Beza, whether it's the King James Version itself. Just, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I've tried for years to not have a King James only label, okay. That's why my website was called Textus Receptus. I'm like, people will respect that because I remember... Um, <clears throat> Was it Jacob Prash? He was going to debate me over Easter in like 2009, you know, say it was a pagan festival and I was just deceived because he's got a lot of Hebrew root sort of stuff. And um, and he did an article about the King James saying he, he can uh, respect those who have a Texas Receptus position but not a King James only position. And I, I th used to think they were poles apart, but now I'm realising pretty much they're exactly the same position except um one is just you know holding that up the other one sort of holding the english edition of it up um they're pretty much it's like splitting hairs over over these issues you know 
yes, we all wish the King James translators had done a parallel Greek text, a Greek and Hebrew parallel polyglot Bible with English and Latin and everything all there. So they could have they could have done that. They could have done English on one side, Greek on the other, Hebrew here, uh, Latin here, you know, work it all out. But they didn't. They just didn't in English. And it's sort of like, well, you guys work it out. You know? We've done our hard bit. And they created their own Greek text. This is what Edward Hill said. He said, the Texas Receptus is, you know, where do we go when TR editions differ? So this is this is quite amazing because um, let me just read what's on the front page of my Texas Receptor site. So David Cloud summarizes the words of Edward F. Hills. The King James Version ought to be regarded not merely as a translation of the Texas Receptus, but also as an independent variety of the Texas Receptus. But what do we do in those few places in which the several editions of a Texas Receptus disagree with one another? Which text do we follow? The answer to this question is easy. We are guided by the common faith. So these guys are like, there's differences in the text. And it's like, well, the answer to this is easy. We're guided by the common faith. Hence, we favor that form of the Texas Receptus upon which more than any other God working providentially has placed the stamp of his approval, namely the King James Version, or more precisely, the Greek text underlying the King James Version. Okay. So a lot of people go, well, that's it. I'm like, that's very, 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 very close because I'm a... You know, get, get my microscope out. I'm like, yeah, that one little reading here and that one little reading there. But, I mean, pretty much you've got the underlying text here. you got the text of Beza you can look at with the annotations. It's got all the readings there. And as we just looked at um, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, that is one of the 20 um, translatable differences between Beza and the King James. So that's why, you know, he's like, oh, it's such a big deal. It's like, yeah, well, that's why the King James translators, they worked on their own Greek text. And so, um, but where do we go? Hills was like, go to the King James or more specifically the Greek text under the King James. When this is not a strange idea, where it's gotten hoarder, like where do we get the 100% Texas receptors? Scrivener's like, well, We'll, we'll use the 1598 as the basis and then we go to the King James and that's what they did and that's what I'm doing <laughs> I'm, I'm going bees is the basis but I, I there is about 20 differences between bees and the King James and that's where I go well the King James translators in those 20 places got it right it's pretty easy to understand, and so that's my position. So I think um, I've gone for two hours, nearly three hours. So I think that's about all that we need to really say. I mean, um, actually, maybe I should just get Jeff Riddle. We'll get Jeff Riddle on the Comiohenium because we just want to show that he does go back to earlier Greek texts. Look, he's going to P74 here, P9. Um, he's reading um, this book by Kruger, who's not a TR guy. Um, he's looking at the ECM project. So anyway, I'm, I'm just trying to sort of um, prove that Jeff Riddle goes to other TR editions. Maybe if I type in Texas. Maybe Complutensium.
Well, he's talking about the Colonnais edition. And he's saying he would not classify it as a mature Protestant edition of the TR. So he's very nuanced with this. Actually, is this a latest article? This will be interesting. Oh, no, that's in 2021. It's um, Hickson on the TR. It just seemed like it was really like a latest sort of thing. But they just keep bringing, re like rehashing this stuff. N yeah, notice he's got the Gerbelius edition, Coffell's edition. He's mentioning all this stuff like three years ago. Okay, so, so this is what Hickson is citing. Um, the flaw in Hickson's critique, the ba basic flaw in Pastor Hickson's critique of my statement is his assumption of what I meant by the printed editions of the TR. Granted, I should also have been clearer, and I'll try to do so in the future to avoid any confusion, by printed editions of the TR, I was not referring to all early printed editions of the Greek New Testament, but specifically to the classic mature Protestant printed editions of the TR, which served as the basis for the Protestant vernacular translations of the Reformation and post-Reformation Protestant Orthodox era. Look, he just, this is like an article three years ago and he's already answered it. Like, can you imagine being Jeff Riddle? He's just like, okay, I'll just, re I'll, I'll just rehash this. Maybe you can just pop this article into chat GPT and say, can you just modernize this for today? And it'll just go, you know, uh, you know, the witch TR, you know. So he's dealt with this a long time ago. But just get a new fresh face on the scene, you know, that you obviously Pastor Hickson's been at loggerheads with um with Jeff Riddle and half the time the comments were Elijah Hickson. He doesn't mention stuff here, but it's like, yeah, anyway, we've got to feel guilty apparently. So I'm going to do an altar call who feels guilty. How many of you guys have been out there saying all the TR editions are exactly identical? How many? Put your hand up. Yes, I can see those hands. You should feel ashamed of yourself. You really need to repent and to cast your sin as far as east is to west. Um, you need to start walking in newness of life and recognize that the TR is just an accident of history, that the word of God has not been preserved, and you need to go out and buy an NIV and a new revised standard uh, reader's edition, um, you need to go and get Metzger's commentary and you need to learn Greek and just feel bad, generally bad about yourself. But if you're not a you know, cultist, if you don't hold the TR or KJV up to, you know, the standard that it is the word of God, um, yeah, there's no guilt. Just go and read your you know, NIV, ESV, even if they contradict each other, even if the ESV says, you know, you have to marry your rapist. <laughs> How's that one? When you're out witnessing, you're telling people about God and they're like, you realize the Bible says you have to marry your rapist? Like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, the ESV says that and the NIV says that. The King James doesn't say that. But unfortunately, that's, you know, People are making these new Bibles. A lot. You, in Australia, I just say, oh, yeah, Rupert Murdoch owns the rights to a lot of these Bibles. <laughs> it's sort of, you know, half truth. It's a bit of a rippling it probably thing. But it just, in Australians' minds, that they know Rupert Murdoch just rule. Basically, he chooses who who's going to be our prime minister and everything. He's just like, oh, yeah. even when Obama got in, like Murdoch was making it, he was, you know, far right. And then they said, um, who's going to get in this next president? And he said, Obama. And sure enough, he just won by a landslide, you know, because <clears throat> he's fake, right? Uh, Helg says it is a TR based on the decisions of the KJV translators versus a critical text based up on modern evangelical scholarship. 
I'll take the former any day of the week, including Sunday. Yeah, so 99.9999999% is Beezer, who got the best of the Goplutensian polyglot of Erasmus, of Stephanus, and he worked on the text for years and years and years and years and years. And the King James translators went, well done, Beezer. We're going to use almost all your work except for 20 tiny little bits. And you've already mentioned those things in your annotations. Thanks for doing all that hard work for us. It's like it's on a silver platter. And, um, yeah, it's it, like the King James did 20, 20 differences. You know, it's like, but we've got to, you know, keep doing videos on this. And it's not even a big deal. Yeah, they've just made it a big deal. Why aren't they focusing on their changes? Why isn't Mark Ward doing you know video after video about the last 12 verses of Mark and the Pricope adulteri? Big variance instead of talking about Holt. You know what I mean? Why doesn't he talk about the, the missing friends? Why just the false friends? Yeah. So anyway, guys, thanks for joining us. I think I'll leave it there. God bless you. And um, yeah, so just to let you know, I'll be interviewing Will Kinney. So that'll be in US time. He's in Colorado, so I've got to figure out the times. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be about um, between sort of like three or four o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, on Good Friday. And um, so that's going to be pretty early for me here on the Saturday morning because we're, we're ahead in time. It's a time warp. And... Um, yeah, we're going to be interviewing Will Kinney. So if you've got questions, comments, you know, uh, it's going to be interesting. So we had a really good time with Peter Van Cleek and also with um, uh, Joseph Armstrong. It was really interesting just to talk to these guys and to see, yeah, because both of these guys are fighting the battle against, you know, modern versions, but, you know, each in their own way. Obviously, they're on, there's a spectrum and they're on different sides of the spectrum. But, um, yet I, I really had a really good time um interviewing those guys so it's going to be fun with will kinney it's going to be really good so um join us for that on friday so god bless you guys uh we'll see you then